the final day of our three-day virtual international conference. Um, I think we shall begin with a welcome note by uh, our Dean, Mr. Srin Tinley. Okay, thank you, Raja Shri. Uh, good morning, <coughs> uh, invited speakers, uh, conference uh, participants and attendees. Uh, it, indeed, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third day of 3D virtual, uh, I mean, International Virtual Conference on Multidimension of South Asian Literary Imagination, Classics to Contemporary. So to begin, I'll just wanted to give just a small uh, report on uh, in this conference uh, about the conference. In this conference, we have received over uh, 80 research uh, abstracts from 70 institutes, colleges, universities from the six uh, countries, along with the 10 invited speakers. And we have observed and we are seen close to 200 participants has been attending this conference. So conferences such as this provide a valuable opportunities to, for experts, academicians, and scholars to sh share experiences. And for today, we have uh, three invited speakers and 12 paper presentations. And of the three invited speakers, two are our former colleagues, uh, Professor Betsy is a former colleague and a Fulbright scholar. And <clears throat> uh, Professor uh, Betsy is a uh, current, I mean, uh, Betsy is a, is a chair in English literature from Southmore College, United States of America. And the next speaker is again, our uh, former colleague, Dr. Rajesh Verma, assistant professor of English from uh, Vaskan Kanya uh, Mahavidya, India. Um, and the third speaker, uh, Today we have is Dr. Alexandro Boscovi, Associate Professor, Department of Modern Language, University of Milano, Italy. So I would like to welcome all the uh, speakers and look forward to listening to your lectures. So <clears throat> with this, I would like to thank all the experts, academicians, and uh, scholars who have joined us in this conference to share their uh, experiences, knowledge, and also more to celebrate uh, this South Asian literature. So once again, I thank you all and wish you, uh, wish you an enjoyable and rewarding conference. So with this, I would like to request uh, our session chair, Dr. Rajeshiri, to conduct the proceeding of the days. Thank you, and Tashi Thank you, Dean, sir. Um, I think we can move on to the lecture by Professor Betsy Bolton that we have been looking forward to since the first day. She was uh, supposed to join us on the first day, but that did not work out for some reasons, but we are so glad that she could join us today. Uh, let me uh, begin with a brief introduction. Um, Betsy Bolton is the author of Women, Nationalism and the Romantic Stage, Theatre and Politics in Britain, 1780 to 1800. She has published a variety of essays on romantic literature, engaging questions of imperialism and colonial politics. More recently, she has published on contemporary issues such as transnational migration. She has also received two Fulbright Awards, the first to study place-based writing in Morocco, and the second to teach the first batch of MA students at Yonfula Centenary College, where she learned a great deal from her colleagues and her students. Betsy Walton holds a PhD in comparative literature from Yale University. She teaches at Swarthmore College, where she chaired the Environmental Studies Program from 2014 to 2017, and where she currently chairs the English Department. It's lovely to have you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you so much. May I share the screen? Yes. Yes. Can you see the presentation? Yes, you can make, yes. You can make it full screen. Yes, I will. Okay, can, does that work? Can people see? Ah, yes. Oh, it's ready. 
Yes, it's moving on its own somehow. All right. So um, I, I extend to all my sincere apologies for uh, mixing up the timing of the talk. Uh, my, when I was in Bhutan, I was always talking with people in the US who were ahead of me. And so my association is that the time runs forward. Um, so about my apologies for uh, being confused about that. I um, wanted to begin this talk, and I may need to ask Chitra to help me with the slides if they keep going um, wonky. By, um, so, and the talk is about um, this idea of nationalism, internationalism, and intranationalism in South Asian literature. Um, I wanted to begin by invoking Kama Ura, and I am having trouble with this. Um, so, of course, you all are probably most familiar with Kama Ura's work in the ballad of Femise Wangtashi or the Hero of a Thousand Eyes. Uh, but he very kindly shared with me an essay that he wrote called Dialogue on the Destiny of Nations in 2013. And I'll return to this at the end of the talk. This was in an, a book called Learning from the World, New Ideas to Redevelop America. And the essay as a whole ends with a warning from a figure known as the Tantric Lama. And the warning is that if we don't have good direction, we may end up in the largest kind of paradox, which is that in the most globalized, complex, and systemically sophisticated nations, people will lead a bewildering economic existence without knowing why and for whom. So part of the challenge, I think, uh, that Dashokam Ura poses for us is how can these nations learn from Bhutan's experience and from South Asia more generally to extricate themselves from this uh, paradox that they have entered into. Um, I think I'm going to stop sharing and ask Chitra if you could um, share the slides instead because it won't advance. Okay, sure, I'll do that. Thank you, I'm sorry. So um, we can click, there we go. So there are three steps to this argument I'd like to make today. I want to um, focus on the great national poet of Pakistan, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, offering a spiritual critique of political oppression. Um, and I want to uh, invoke some theorists, Edward Said, Ernest Renan, Benjamin, uh, uh, Benedict Anderson, and Partha Chatterjee, to set up some of the terms that might help us think about national identity throughout these three steps of the argument. So we begin with a kind of framework and then um, we think about uh, Faiz's poetry. And then we move on to um, looking at a couple of novels that move back and forth between India and the US and or Pakistan and the US. So looking at uh, Moesin Hamid's The Reluctant Fundamentalist and Kiran Desai's The Inheritance of Loss. And then um, we'll close uh, looking at Moesin Hamid's um, other novel, uh, more recent novel, Exit West and um, some Bhutanese writers that you know very well. Um, so I think we can advance, thank you. Um, so beginning with Said, um, I really just wanted to, to ask you to hold a couple of terms and ideas from Edward Said's Orientalism, both the idea of imaginative geographies and his insistence on the way in which the imaginative geography of the Orient is a system of representations that becomes repressive because it is a system that the West has created to confine and constrain writers, thinkers, people from the East. So just hold those two terms, if you will, as we move forward. 
as we think about um, nationalism, one early scholar writing on the question of what is a nation was the French uh, theorist Ernest Renan. And he said three things that I think are really interesting and somewhat contradictory and troubling. The first is to belong to a nation, you need a rich legacy of memories. You have to have shared memory and experience. You also need present day consent, which he sometimes calls a daily referendum. Every day we have to decide we belong to this nation. At the same time, even as we build on this legacy of memories, we also have to forget. And what we have to forget are the atrocities other members of our nation commit against us and our group and the atrocities that we have committed against others. And so he specifies, in thinking of his own nation of France, he specifies that every French citizen has forgotten St. Bartholomew's Day, a day of a huge massacre, and the 13th century massacres in the Midi. You can't be French without having gotten past these atrocities. So hold on to those ideas too, if you will. Legacy of memories, the importance of forgetting, and a daily commitment to a national, to a national identity. Benedict Anderson picks up and runs with this and um, talks about the ways in which nations are imagined communities. So Said's imaginative geography turns into this imagined community. And Anderson says this happens, this develops partly through the development of the printing press, which made sacred texts like the Christian Bible less important. And what rose instead was print culture in the form of the newspaper, which could be read each morning by people of different ages in different places, conscious of one another sharing this experience of reading a newspaper together. He also talks about homogeneous empty time, um, which is that empty calendar. Instead of sacred time, we have empty time. Um, Anderson goes on to say, and this is the, the passage that's most frequently quoted, is that it's an imagined community. And I, here's a question for Bhutan. Even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members. I was always told everybody in Bhutan knew everybody else. So maybe this doesn't hold for Bhutan. But even though you may not meet or hear of another Bhutanese person, yet in the minds of each lives the image of their communion, their connection. That connection is experienced as a deep horizontal comradeship, which is an explanation of the puzzle of why so many millions of people are willing not just to kill for the nation, but willing to die for the nation, even though it is only a limited imagining. By the, so one of so I'm very interested in these imagined communities and print culture. Benedict Anderson goes on to talk about uh, Creole nations uh, coming out of the process of colonialism and how they developed a kind of modular structure where you could kind of just slot the structure of a nation in in different places. And Partha Chatterjee um, in the book uh, Nations and Their Fragments quite rightly demanded, wait, wait, who's imagined community here? Who is doing the imagining? So think about Edward Said's um, earlier questions about imaginative geography. If, says Chatterjee, if nationalisms in Africa and Asia are, all they can do is choose this modular form that the West already invented, what do they have left to imagine? It's like, that's not an acceptable way to think about these structures. What, what we need is an anti-colonial nationalism that is grounded in a spiritual realm that's been developed by India's um, ancient cultures. Um, and this, this spiritual development, including language, um, needs to be uh, held onto. We, we don't need to focus on the materiality of this Western modular nation. We need to focus on what is native um, and 
imagine more freely alternatives. So that's sort of the terms that I want you to kind of hold on to for the rest of the talk. Imaginative geography, representation, the combination of sharing memories and forgetting the harms we do to one another, consenting daily to be a part of a nation, imagining a community through print culture, through novels, through being curious about how we ourselves participate and um, having this call to spiritual and linguistic definition and alternative. So with that kind of backdrop, um, I want to turn very briefly. So this is just going to be touching very briefly on a number of different texts, but I wanted to look at Faiz Ahmad Faiz's Hamdekenge, which, and not just the poem, but also it, the uses of that poem. Um, it's performance by the singer Iqbal Bano in Lahore, as a, a gesture of resistance and uh, revolution. Um, and then it's more recent recitation by students in India protesting the Citizenship Amendment Act. If we, thank you, Chitra. And so, so if we think about, now I'm on the um, right-hand side of the slide. If we think about um, Faiz Ahmad Faiz as this immensely honored national poet of Pakistan um, critiquing oppression, that critique, even though he is so grounded in, um, in both pre-partition India and um, post-partition Pakistan, his uh, critique operates for me across the world. Um, and so I have this map because of um, this, this notion of flawed democracy versus authoritarian regimes. Um, I would say the US is, is falling down the scale a little bit here. And so um, on the next slide, part of, uh, so up in the upper left corner, um, when President Trump was elected in 2016, the New York writer Rajat Singh said, our response to this event is that we should all be reading Faiz Ahmad Faiz. And we should be reading Faiz Ahmad Faiz because of this critique of state oppression that he offers. Um, the way that in this poem, Ham de Genge, um, he uses Hum, the uh, Hindi for I or we, as a universal call to social and collective action. He uses Nazm, the Urdu uh, free verse form, um, in a revolutionary aesthetic so that uh, he's creating, and I'm still quoting Singh here, he's creating an opening for his readers to, uh, to see new possibilities for acting in and on the world. We shall see, certainly we too shall see that day that has been promised to us when these high mountains of tyranny and oppression turn to fluff and evaporate. And we oppressed beneath our feet will have this earth shiver, shake and beat and heads of rulers will be struck with crackling lightning and thunder roars. And then he takes core Islamic imagery of the Kayaba, the day of reckoning, and he turns it to criticize the religious fundamentalism of Ziad ul Haq. So Faiz himself was a uh, communist. Um, he was resisting the religious fundamentalism of the military regime. And uh, so there's a link up in the top that we don't have time to listen to right now, but if there were extra time or if anybody wanted to go back later um, and look, it is of this singer Iqbal Bano um, singing this uh, poem. What happened was Ziad ul Haq um, banned the wearing of saris in Pakistan. And so Iqbal Bano put on a black sari and um, proclaimed this poem to, to great um, popular acclaim. So part of what I want us to focus on here is the use of metaphor, the use of literary technique to turn things from a rigid doctrinal refusal into a space of new possibility. 
So, and if we could move forward. Thank you so much, Chitra. So that's all I'm going to say about Faiz. Ask me questions if we have time at the end. The next step of the argument is looking at um, two writers, uh, Moesin Hamid in The Reluctant Fundamentalist and Kiran Desai in The Inheritance of Loss, moving back and forth between the US as an imperial country, nation, and um, either Pakistan or India. And so starting with The Reluctant Fundamentalist, um, which is a, an important text in the curriculum, um, I want, again, just to take one small moment here. Um, so Changez, our hero, is down valuing a publishing company in Buenos Aires. And the owner, Juan Batista, invites him out to lunch in order to ask him some very pertinent questions. So he starts, Juan Batista, by saying, does it trouble you, Changez, to make your living by disrupting the lives of others? And Changez says, we just value. That's all we do. We don't decide whether to buy or sell. We don't know what happens to a company after we have valued it. And so I want you to hear that word, right? Um, Hamid is leaning into the lack of human values that Changez has imbibed, um, that this valuing means only economic values. Um, if you try to advance one more, Chitra, there might be, maybe it didn't, yeah. So American consultants, what I love about, one thing I love about this book is the way he makes it clear that the true fundamentalists are these American consultants who repeatedly insist that we dwell on the, uh, the bottom line, the true fundamentals of profit and money. Juan Batista goes on to say, have you heard of the Janissaries? And Changa says, no. Juan Batista says, they were Christian boys captured by the Ottomans and trained to be soldiers in a Muslim army, which was at that time the greatest army in the world. They were ferocious and utterly loyal they had fought to erase their own civilization so they had nothing else to turn to. Tips the ash of his cigarette onto a plate. So there's implied an allegory here, right? That Changez is, is a Janissary, um, that he has been turned against his own civilization, his own people. Um, and so he is more ferocious as a fighter for imperialist American corporations. And in fact, Hamid makes it clear, in case we were missing it, um, Juan Batista makes it clear, how old were you when you went to America? Changa says, I was 18, I went for college, oh, much older. The Janissaries were always taken in childhood. It would have been far more difficult to devote themselves to their adopted empire, you see, if they had memories they could not forget. So, um, Another tap forward, we might remember from Renan the importance of memories um, and the way in which memories shape our, the soul, the spiritual principle of the nation. It's also interesting that Changez has lost his memory for the taste of this food, um, whereas the dialogue in the novel, the dialogue with the American focuses endlessly on taste and sensory extravagance as a kind of counterpoint to this militaristic encounter with an American. So um, what do international identities offer us um, in a post-colonial world? I think that Mohsin Hamid would say a stay against empire, a, a barrier, a safety against empire and its destruction. It offers us home. It offers us that identity. Anthony Giddens is a sociologist talking about ontological security and um, in post-traditional environments. And I think that's another point we could pursue, but I don't think I have time. So we'll keep going. Kiran Desai, her inheritance of loss won the Man Booker Award in 2006. There are two generations at work in this novel, the older colonial generation of the judge and the aunties um, and the cook, and then the younger generation of the judge's granddaughter, Sai, the cook's son, Bijou, Sai's tutor and lover. And everyone is dealing with post-colonial nationalist ethnic troubles. 
one of the things that all generations can agree on is that they don't like English writers writing about India. It turned the stomach. Remember, I mean, it's interesting how much food and taste and stomach comes up. Over and over, there's a scene of late arrival at a dark bungalow, the cook cooking in a black kitchen. And Sai realized her own delivery to Kalimpong was just part of the monotony, not the original. The repetition had willed her, anticipated her, cursed her. Certain moves made long ago produced all of them. So that might sound a little familiar from Edward Said's idea that they are constrained by this literary past that is written, they have been represented to death by these English writers. So Chatterjee says, what's left to imagine in this world? And what I think um, Kiran Desai says is New York City is left to imagine. Let's go look at the underside of this empire. And so she takes the cook's son Bijou to um, New York City where, and we could move on to the next slide, where he becomes one of many in food insecure restaurant workers, um, some of the most impoverished people in the city. Um, where he, so he gets a job at a restaurant called Baby Bistro, where there's also a Pakistani man working and they get into a fight, Desi versus Paki, insulting each other. And the Frenchman who owns the restaurant swears at them. <laughs> I love the swear, you know, it's like you, they can't even hear the word. It sounded like an angry dandelion puff. But what he said was they were a troublesome pair. The sound of their fight had traveled up the flight of stairs and struck a clunky note and they might upset the balance. Perfectly first world on top, perfectly third world, 22 steps below mix it up in a heap and who would patronize his restaurant with its coquille Saint-Jacques à la vapeur for 27.50 and the Blanquette de Vaux. So all the French names um, registering that and a duck that made an overture to the colonies sitting like a pasha on a cushion of its own fat. Hear the Orientalism in that description, right? Exuding the scent of saffron. What were they thinking, says the owner, to the Paki and the Desi fighting in his kitchen. Do restaurants in Paris have cellars full of Mexicans, Desis, and Pakis? No, they do not. What are you thinking? And then the narrative says, they have restaurants full of Algerians, Senegalese, Moroccans. Those are the people who work in these restaurants. That, that French authenticity and purity is being produced by this neo-colonial underside. And I probably won't read all of this, but um, part of how Desai delightfully pushes our understanding of that repetition is through stylistic extravagance. Um, so, he, so the cook gets his job with the judge because his father presents his resume to the judge in this list of dishes that he can cook. Banana fritter, pineapple fritter, apple fritter, apple surprise, apple charlotte, apple berry, bread and butter, jam tart, caramel custard, tipsy pudding, rum tum pudding, jam roly poly, ginger steam, date pudding. Where am I? I got lost. Lemon, pancake, egg custard, orange custard, coffee custard, strawberry custard, trifle, baked Alaska, mango souffle, hot chocolate pudding, cold coffee pudding, coconut pudding, milk pudding, pudding, rum baba, rum cake, brandy snap, pear stew, guava stew, plum stew, apple stew, peach stew, apricot stew, mango pie, chocolate tart, apple tart, gooseberry tart, lemon tart, jam tart, marmalade tart, babinka, floating island, pineapple upside down, uh, gooseberry upside down, plum upside down, peach upside down, raisin upside down, we end upside down. And so the extravagance, the energy of that passage, I think brings an immense delight. I love reading that. Even as it says, look at the constraints, look at how limited this menu coming from a colonial structure actually is. Is that the best we can do? So in the very, uh, I mean, this comes 70 pages on, and I really won't read all of this, um, but I want you to hear how similar 
the structure is former slaves and natives, Eskimos and Hiroshima people, Amazonian Indians and Chiapas Indians and Chilean Indians and American Indians and Indian Indians. And she goes on listing all of these nationalities. So here's our national focus. And then I'll pick up at the end, um, Cameroonians, Laotians, Zarians coming at you screaming colonialism, screaming slavery, screaming mining companies, screaming banana companies, oil companies, screaming CIA spy among the missionaries, screaming it was Kissinger who killed their father. And why don't you forgive third world debt? Lumumba, they shouted, and Allende on the other side. Pinochet, they said, Mobutu, contaminated milk from Nestle, they said, Agent Orange, dirty dealings, every day in the papers, another thing. Here, here's another restaurant. This is Bijou working in another high upper scale restaurant. People reading the newspapers. So think about Benedict Anderson and that ritual of reading the newspapers, but suddenly the newspapers are full of different stories. So we have this full list of coming and screaming and outrage. And then we hear the reader of the newspaper. Nestle and Xerox were fine upstanding companies the backbone of the economy, and Kissinger was at least a patriot. The United States was a young country built on the finest principles, and how could it possibly owe so many bills? Enough was enough. Business was business. Your bread might as well be left unbuttered were the butter to be spread so thin. The fittest one wins and gets the butter. So here we move from third world debt to the United States moral debt, ethical debt. We have a turn that um, gives us a kind of social Darwinism, the fittest wins and gets the butter, but the butter is this idea that if one were to share evenly with all of these nations, that there would be too little left. And so enough was enough means my enough is what I will hold to. Um, how am I doing for time? I think I'll skip past this slide, um, Chitra. Do, do feel free to give me a high sign, Rajasthri, if you would. Um, so, so on the one hand, we have Hamid offering this international approach to post-colonial literature, looking at the US and Pakistan together, and then Desai framing a conversation between the US, between India and the US. Um, this time I think is a kind of accounting. At the end of the novel comes the claim, we are all voices of the same poverty. And I think that poverty is what Desai is particularly good at registering in this, uh, in this novel. So now we turn to the last, the third um, idea, which is of a kind of post-nationalism or intranationalism. Are there alternatives to this idea of nationalism that might help us move forward? Um, can we advance the slide again? Or is it stuck? Okay, and so um, here I'd like to, again, glance quickly at Mohsin Hamid's Exit West, just to expand people's reading um, from the first uh, novel that you have done, and then look at some canonical Bhutanese authors. In Exit West, we'll just keep moving forward as best you can, Chitra, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, yeah, so we'll keep moving forward through this. Um, Exit West came out in 2017, so already in the Trump era, um, and it was uh, nominated for the Booker. It was very popular with critics and with um, popular readers as well. Um, and the motif on the next slide is uh, the central idea. Oh, and I, I said enter East because um, 
I mean, I thought of this novel because of my ability almost to come back to Jan Pula and through a screen um, to come back to a world that is very precious to me. And as his characters do, only um, if we click forward again, they do it through magical doors, um, doors that open from a war-torn city, which is not named, into uh, Greece or into London. Um, and so this is a, just a motif. It's a plot device. But what it lets Hamid do is um, explore a world in which nations cannot defend their boundaries, that people are always, those boundaries have become porous, and people are always able to come in greater numbers than can be turned back to appear within the heart of the nation. And so, um, and then there are just lots of pictures of doors. I loved this idea of magic doors. There's an opening into um, Lesbos, which of course has a terrible fire um, destroying the, it really harming the refugee community there, or this idea of where would a door take you? Um, if we move forward, where it takes, oh, and then this was just a film. Somebody is now filming movies on Zoom, which seems crazy to me. Hamid um, has his characters, um, Nadia and Said, come to London, which the authorities then try to close down and have a dark London where the refugees are and a light London where the natives get to live. But on the brink of a massacre, they decide they cannot harm people so much. And so what they build is a halo of settlements around the city of London. And I think we're meant to hear the idea of both the circular nation, but also nature, but also the kind of angelic halo of refuge that this provides. He then has these characters refuse to settle there and they move on to California to, be, to take part in an informal um, city built on Mount Tamalpais above San Francisco. And so again, this is about mobility. This is about rethinking mobility. Um, but what these characters are searching for is a space of safety. And so I think the novel lets us focus on the possibility of peace as a human right um, that is not a national uh, benefit, but something broader than that. Um, if we click forward once or twice, um, so they squat in London and then build this halo. It's very much subsistence living in California, but the characters seem pretty happy to have that living. What we have now, of course, with one more click is, so that's Mount Tamalpais, but this is what California looks like right now. Um, and so the illusion of safety, I think, um, that Hamid was associating with England and the US is perhaps more of a mirage than anyone would want it to be. If we go forward, um, so I think Hamid is trying to offer us new ways to grapple with inequality. This is just at the bottom of the slide and maybe redefining human rights to peace um, or security above national claims to security. So then, um, I wondered about this. So really, if you can't defend a national border, how much of a nation are you? Is this something post-national? Um, or are there other ways of challenging or thinking about national identity? And so I wanted to end by looking briefly at Kamapunso's essay, which is a, a part of the curriculum at uh, Yonpula, The Cultural Construction of Bhutan, and then Kama Ura's dialogue, circling back to that and ending with Kunsang Chodun's, uh, just an instance from the circle of karma. Kama Punso's um, cultural construction of Bhutan raises a number of interesting points. It starts with, um, if you click forward, the idea that um, Bhutan's emphasis on cultural identity for sovereignty needs to be understood in a global context. And he takes, I think, that idea about um, sovereignty, national survival, relying on cultural identity. That actually comes from Karma Ura, who's usually the person um, to whom that claim or that idea is attributed. 
what Kamapunso is saying here is that we don't need one culture, a multiplicity of cultures, a plurality can be a national asset and strength in the midst of a world increasingly mixed and monotonous. If we go forward, um, I think that's a great um, idea and claim. And so he's really pushing for ways to support a cultural plurality, which all Bhutanese can share using modern facilities and technology. But earlier in the essay, he also said that those modern technologies led to everybody liking sweet tea and emadatse and maybe losing some of the differentiation of those cultures. So there's a, there's a little bit of a challenge there. On the next slide, um, part of here, I am really intrigued by the language. Um, so uh, he's talking about the bedrock of personal identity and a kind of social cement holding societies together. It's almost a, a builder's language, right? You need rocks, you need cement. How are we gonna build this thing? Um, he talks about shared values, mores, and practices in a way that seem like an alternative to Benedict Anderson's print culture, the focus on newspapers and novel reading. And yet that bedrock and social cement worry me a little bit. As Punso himself says, that's, that's, that was a great place to move forward, thank you. Um, he talks about, um, in the next slide, the, um, the, non, the need for a non-essentialist understanding of cultural identity in the Buddhist idea of non-self or the absence of self-existence beyond all this diversity. I take this to be the idea of dependent arising, that you can't point to one thing and say, that's it, there's national identity. It's all just this mix of many different factors. So this single factor does not define the cultural identity of a Bhutanese person. And yet, if we move forward, um, so what I thought he was going to say was, so we can't hold on to a national identity. We have to move beyond that claim to bedrock. But instead he says, we need to shore up dress and uh, language and literature and traditional social events and customs. We need all of those to be stabilized, which is an interesting move I think to make. So if we, the next slide, please. Um, so the interesting thing for me was um, that because Karma Ura is the figure associated with national survival being tied to cultural identity, you wouldn't think he would be the person to say, forget personal identity, um, forget cultural identity. And yet it seems to me that in this dialogue, he does. It's a charming piece written in the form of a conversation, a slightly stylized conversation with a tantric lama who brings the wisdom of Vajrayana Buddhism to bear, a skeptic youth who wants all kinds of wonderful things, but uh, is not willing to put in the work to make them happen, that's the warning. Um, Anglo-Saxon historian who's very uh, Western focused, you gotta do it our way, a techno utopist who thinks cows shouldn't put cow pats on mountain paths. So he's a little foolish. General man killer, his job is to kill people and he does it well. And the Bhutanese peasant who is just trying to survive. So these are the figures who are traveling together. And the, um, the so if we move to the next slide, um, the skeptic youth, um, presents, I think, Kama Punso's point of view. Tantric Lama talks glibly about self-afflictions and dissolving the self. But do you mean all the particularities that make me what I am in terms of gender, communal affinity, cultural heritage, political leanings, biographic memories, and emotional patterns, that all that should be dissolved and I should transcend them? How can I? They are the basis of me. And because he's a little whiny, he's like, I can't be altruistic and compassionate if I can't be me. But moving to the next slide, the tantric lama says, you are right, absolutely. 
dissolving the self without being nihilistic may entail transcending the particularities that give you your identity. Personal identity is vital at an ordinary level. So that might be where Karma Punso and Karma Ura here come together. But it should be abandoned as we try to achieve a state of enlightenment and a life guided and led by such a composite combined viewpoint ultimately brings happiness to all, including yourself. And so the tantric lama's willingness to give up national identity. And again, this is addressed to Americans. So maybe it's a pitch. Americans need to give up on some of those particularities and national identity. But it lets him chart this path of eight recommendations moving forward. Um, so there's a couple more. And I want to just focus on, um, because it's so relevant to the other texts we've been talking about, the middle path between capitalism and socialism something different from both. And I think a lot of the writers we've been talking about are in search of that middle path. If you tap a couple more points down, um, I'm big on climate repair. I think that's really important. Um, but uh, the equality of wealth, gender, and nation is another point. And so I wanna just look at how, I think there's a ninth one, yes, um, at uh, how the second point and the eighth point come together in a particular moment that I especially like in Circle of Karma. So again, just brushing over Circle of Karma um, by Kunzang Choden. Um, can we advance uh, the slide? There's a, what I want to look at is a moment when Tsomo, who has suffered in many different ways and has been working on the road, um, uh, endlessly um, is, am I, I'm sorry, I will wrap up quickly, um, is uh, asked to get on a truck that is going to drive along the road she has been helping to build. She has uh, been exiled from her home. She has seen her younger friend assaulted and abused. They have worked endlessly and they climb on this truck and it feels like it should be this moment of, wow, now we're really moving. And instead, it's torment. And so I'm going to start with the second paragraph. Somo covered her eyes with her hands and screamed as the truck began to move. She thought she was dying. All the mountains and the trees seemed to spin, and the road was coming toward her at a maddening speed. Something was surely wrong. All her insides felt like they were moving and threatening to come through her mouth. She continued to cover her eyes with one hand. With the other, she held onto the side of the vehicle, fearing she would be tossed into the air and out of the moving vehicle. Somewhere in her consciousness, she was weakly asking herself, why are we making these roads so that we travel on them and then get so sick? I wanna remind you of that question we started with, the Tantric Lama saying, if we are not careful, we end up in a paradox where people are in this economically bewildering world, working for what and for whom they know not. And I think that is the existence that Somo is struggling with right now. The narrative, the narrator's voice um, comes back and says, she doesn't need to have worried about that because the roads would be there for a long time, but only for people who could afford motors. Those who had built the roads would only be able to walk. They had struggled in heat, cold heat rain until they had become indistinguishable from the roads, bound to the roads by their blood and sweat. But for the people who could drive on the roads, these, these roads were our roads built by our laborers. For them, the laborers were indeed indistinguishable from the roads. Here, the difference between those two indistinguishable from the roads, one is a binding through labor, through commitment, and the other is a dehumanizing uh, exclusion of uh, uh, people from the voice of the nation constructed by those roads. So I'm gonna stop um, there. Uh, we'll skip past that slide. Oh, the last slide, I don't have the last two slides because they didn't save. Um, what I wanted to um, end with was just to say, I'd love for you to take away from this talk the work of metaphor in turning 
fundamentalist rigidity into possibility, the work of allegory in opening up um, a critique of neocolonialism, repetition as exuberance against the constraints of that colonial past, um, debates about how much identity we need to hold on to, and, um, and then this embodied uh, opening as we followed Somo's life, her persistence through these difficulties and her insistence on pursuing a spiritual uh, idea of both the nation and of her own life within that nation. Thank you very much for your time and your patience with me. And I think we could stop sharing because these are this is they didn't save correctly the PowerPoint. So that was that was the end. Uh, a huge thank you, Professor Bolton, for that uh, very fascinating lecture. You made use of several South Asian texts to explore the manifestation of nationalism, internationalism, and post-nationalism. I'm sure the audience has benefited from this lecture. Uh, I believe we do have a few questions in the chat box. I request my colleague, uh, Dr. Sain, to conduct the Q&A session. Thank you so much, uh, respected professor, for this fascinating uh, set of reflections. It was amazing to hear from you the different dimensions about that you brought in through this particular lecture with respect to Bhutan, India, and also and also beyond uh, that, and how you beautifully weaved thematically and theoretically. So we already have uh, a, a few questions in the in the chat box, a few comments and questions. So first, I would like to. Uh, share the first question that Mr. Himanshu Kumar uh, shares with you. It's basically a set of questions which are interlinked uh, with each other. So uh, Himanshu says that Faiz uses a number of religious metaphors in his revolutionary poems. Uh, did he do so because he was a believer or was he using them just to add more meat to his arguments. Just in connection with that question, is Faiz's idea of Vatan different from that of nation? Mm -hmm. And he also connects it with a third point, and he says that often Faiz compares the authoritative and dictatorial ad administration with dog. For example, in his poem, Nisar Me Teri Galioke. So don't you think it's offensive for the dogs and they deserve a better deal? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I am totally in agreement with that, uh, with that last line. Um, th these are very interesting questions and I suspect that Mr. Himanshu Kumar might have wonderful things to say in uh, filling them out more. Um, my understanding of Faiz is that his, uh, his commitment is to communism and that therefore the religious metaphors are, uh, I mean, he was raised Muslim and uh, trained in Rumi and Hafiz and, you know, is definitely a scholar. But my sense is that he, his commitment is to turning those metaphors and images in order to open up um, possibilities. And that connects to this idea of Watan, um, which I think is, I would read as a more spiritual sense of the nation. So less the border controlled area and more um, the, the nation of the heart, more um, that spiritual principle that uh, Renan talks about. But I would welcome thoughts from Mr. Himanshu Kumar on this if we have time. Uh, so, in case, uh, will Mr. Himanshu Kumar would like to share his perspectives? Uh, Himanshu, if you'd like to do that, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Or, uh, maybe maybe we can we can go ahead with the next question and in case if he joins and would like to share 
uh, that would be perfectly fine. So the next question is from Munna Gurung. She's a master's student in our college. Currently, she's doing a master's in YCC. And uh, she, uh, her question is, though multiculturality or cultural plurality is considered to be the strength and richness of any nation, yet we find nations experiencing chaos due to cultural clashes, so how we tackle such violent experiences? I think that is a wonderful and very important question. I had um, what part of what didn't say was a slide with pictures of the Portland protests in the United States, which uh, have become more violent. Um, and so I think this is a very imminent question that we need to grapple with. Um, part of where I think the violence is coming from both in the United States and in India is from an increasing polarization, a separation um, between communities and a refusal to forget past atrocities um, and instead a revisiting of atrocities. And so there's a uh, I, I can speak best for the United States. So there's this scorekeeping and there's this um, sense that whatever the other says cannot be true, which is why Faiz seems so important to me because um, so when the students were chanting Hum de Kenge in Kanpur, a faculty member um, at the IIT said, um, that is an anti-India poem. And the students were like, no, it is not. You have to remember that in Lahore, it was an anti-Pakistan poem. People complained about Faiz as an anti-Pakistani poet. It's, it's neither of those things, right? He is using the universal, he is speaking to we. He is imagining a world in which we together exceed the oppression and part of the way that strong men stay in power is by separating us. I was saying before we started that in the United States, people do not read the same news. We are not, we are not inhabiting the same nation and we have to figure out a way to do that again, perhaps through poetry, if not through news. I don't know if that answers your question, Muna, but it's, a, it's an excellent one. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, for your uh, reflections. And we move into our uh, next question, and it is by Dr. Prashant Viji uh, from uh, Kilandi, Kerala. And his, his question is, the nationalist sense brought in by the print culture and novel, as alluded by Anderson, has given way to more of a visual culture today, along with the widespread social media. Is it time that we need to look at nationalism in the new light in a post-truth world? I think it absolutely is. And social media is exactly the place where the conflicts are happening and where in the US uh, elections are being decided. Um, so yes, if you, have a, if you have an essay on that or a book on that, I think you, have a, you will have a rapt audience, sir. I think that is a very timely question. It's not my field. I'm not, um, I'm not prepared myself to, uh, to go into the social media world with the analytic tools I would need. So, but I would, I would eagerly read your work if, uh, if, you, if you wanted to share um, any of that. And we will go with the last question. And uh, the question is from Aditi Bhel. And uh, uh, her, her question is, ma'am, how do you think the idea of nation for South Asian countries, and specifically in the, within the brackets, uh, she mentions the post-colonial nations, different from that of the Western nations? And what she mean by Western nations, again, she has put it there, the Western nations being originators of the idea of nation, in my opinion, as, as she says. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just go back to Partha Chatterjee, who, um, who I think responded to that question by saying um, an important difference needs to be um, and that we need an anti-colonial nation. Um, we need 
the countries of um, Asia, the countries of Africa, to have bigger imaginations than the West's one model fits all, this modular um, sense of national identity. So um, I, part of what I have most appreciated in reading these works is both seeing how a writer like Mohsin Hamid says, no, this is wrong. This is A, in Reluctant Fundamentalist, this is not national identity, this is empire. We cannot, we cannot support empire. This is not something with our hearts and our minds we can agree to. Um, that Kiran Desai can say, if we are constrained this way, if, if the West invented it, what can we do with the forms that were invented? Let's turn them upside down. So I think the call is for the nations of South Asia to do better, to strip down the model, to reconceive of what this national identity would be. I do think there's reason to think of it as a spiritual practice, as a shared community, but not as a modular fixed Western idea. So I hope, I hope that the West will be learning more from the East as we go forward. Thank you so much, Professor, for your uh, kind reflections. And now, and that's it for the question and answer. Now I request Dr. Rajeshree to take over. Thank you, Sayan. Uh, thank you, Professor Betsy, for your wonderful lecture and also for interacting with the audience and for clarifying their queries and concerns. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I can, I can you. see some messages. Thank you so much to everyone who has sent a chat message. I can't respond right now, but um, I hope to hear from you over email or some other way. It is such a pleasure to have been with you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Betsy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dean. So nice to see you. Okay, take care and stay safe. Bye -bye. It is hard to leave. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> yeah, it's already late for you. You don't want to <laughs> retain further by delaying the process. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night, night ma'am. So we shall move on with our program. And I think our former colleague, Dr. Rajesh Verma is already logged in. Dr. Verma will be delivering the second plenary lecture today. Hello, sir. Uh, let me begin by introducing uh, Dr. Verma uh, for our audience. Rajesh Verma is an assistant professor of English at Vasan Kanya Mahavidyale. Varanasi, and he has recently completed his tenure as Colombo Plan lecturer. He has edited a book on Gandhi and published articles in various journals. He has been the resource person in some of the international seminars, and he is currently working on a project on language and communication in collaboration with English for Nation. Uh, welcome, sir, and I hand over the session to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I won't be able to share my video because here network is uh, really fluctuating uh, due to bad weather. So uh, I'm sorry uh, that I will have to stop my video so that I can have an un uh, uninterrupted uh, and uh, I can deliver my lecture. Uh, so I'm sorry. But yes, uh, uh, so it is I mean, uh, so good and nice to see you people uh, once again. and. Uh, we are really struggling here. We means here. I am struggling because of the weather issues and Corona, and uh, I mean, so uh, so it's like a, a travel from paradise to <laughs> when it uh, when uh, Adam and Eve they must have been banished from the paradise. How would they have felt? Uh, that's the kind of <laughs> uh, my feeling is. I'm still uh, struggling to adjust here. By the way, uh, so thank you once again, uh, Madam Sister, for uh, inviting me. Uh, to deliver a note. It is indeed an honor and uh, I congratulate you that you have uh, conducted the three day uh, an international conference uh, on South Asia and uh, uh, it was uh, by uh, privilege uh, that I dealt with this uh, paper 
for two semesters uh, in, uh, in in Bhutan, and I could read something about it, and then I could imagine and I could think about uh, South Asia, and uh, and uh, so. Uh, but here I am going to uh, just share uh, a kind of survey uh, how South Asia uh, in general and India in particular has been uh, responding to the Western's uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, like canon. And uh, I have taken this uh, canon uh, with, this, uh, with a reason, uh, there is a reason because if you see that in Bhutan, uh, when I was dealing with, I mean, this master's program, I could see that uh, we are still in our uh, curriculum design. Uh, we are highly influenced by the uh, Western notions, uh, Western uh, curriculums, and uh, somehow uh, we are, I mean, not paying enough attention to the local needs, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, native uh, literature. And uh, an interesting essay uh, I came across there was uh, by Michael Eris, uh, that uh, uh, boneless tongue. Uh, alternative traditions in Islamic society. Uh, that was very interesting essay which uh, told that even uh, within, you know, I mean, uh, third world countries or South Asian countries, you can see the uh, structures, the hierarchical structures. So that led me to think, and uh, I, it's not kind of like any research paper, it is just a survey, so please bear with me. Uh, I will read my uh, paper here, and uh, so, uh, I will begin with uh, Sheldon Pollock, and uh, we all know about Sheldon Pollock. Uh, he has worked extensively on uh, Sanskrit literature, and he has translated, and uh, re uh, recently uh, he has been uh, commissioned by uh, Infosys Director to translate uh, uh, many of the Sanskrit uh, texts into English, and that's, uh, I mean, uh, huge, uh, hugely funded uh, project about which uh, uh, there are certain reservations uh, from the uh, Indian scholars that why uh, so much fund was given to a foreigner, to an American uh, who has no uh, clear idea about our indigenous text, and he is going to represent us. And one uh, uh, more controversy was there that uh, uh, he was allowed to establish one much there in America, uh, but uh, later on, uh, some uh, scholars, Indian scholars, uh, interfered, and uh, then this attempt was uh, uh, I mean, stopped. Now, here I won't, uh, don't want to be a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, patriot or chauvinist in that sense. But yes, uh, this canonical approach has been a serious problem uh, with the indigenous scholars, especially with the uh, non-English speaking people uh, when they go to the universities, when they go to the colleges, and they. Uh, are not that fluent in English and they don't understand uh, that language that well. Even today, then uh, they have to read uh, English literature and all. And throughout their career or throughout their life, they keep on struggling and struggling without ever realizing their true potential. So, with that purpose, uh, I have taken. So, yes, Sheldon Pollock, who has done extensive research on, uh, I mean, uh, South Asian literature, uh, uh, he edited one book and there he starts like by saying. Uh, that literatures of South Asia constitute one of the great achievements of human creativity. Uh, in their antiquity, continuity, and multicultural complexity combined, they are unmatched in world literary history and unrivaled in the resources they offer for understanding the development of expressive language and imagination over time and in relation to larger orders of culture, society, and polity. Now, Sheldon Pollock, this observation is kind of a general observation because whenever any uh, uh, you know, uh, non-Asian uh, or uh, I mean the Westerners, when they, whenever they visit us, our our countries, and they visit our monasteries, temples, that's the kind of observation they always uh, pass. So nothing, I mean, uh, here nothing I mean, extraordinary here. But uh, his observation is like that: South Asian literature. Uh, so uh, despite its uh, heavy uh, uh, imaginative uh, richness, it has not uh, occupied a marginal, uh, it has not occupied a central place in the various universities and various academia, even in India also, in South Asia also. So from here I start. Now we all know that South Asia, uh, South Asia, such words, uh, they, I mean, uh, at least they were not popular before 1930s, 40s. And uh, we know that uh, the South Asia 
was a more kind of geopolitical construction. Uh, you know, uh, the first two world wars, the first world war and the second world war, uh, from there, this America, America's hegemony uh, grew up and then in order to have a better understanding of the uh, non-American countries, they wanted to go for the area studies. So from there, uh, they elaborated the idea of uh, South Asia and it started with the uh, uh, like area study. It was not kind of uh, like uh, literary studies at all. And for that purpose, they wanted to understand the languages and through language literature as well. So, but yes, now South Asia is kind of popular word, very popular, very powerful, but it, it, it still puzzles us. It is still produced in the sense like our own experiences when uh, IIT professor visited and she was saying, why do we have South Asian and cultural studies and I mean, two, three uh, segments. And we, she said that it is better to erase the boundaries and make it one. So even today, academicians, uh, they don't really uh, kind of uh, define, they cannot define what South Asian literature or South Asia actually is. So, and we also know that uh, uh, we had already uh, so many uh, nomenclatures like Commonwealth literature, Third World literature, post-colonial literature. So how does uh, South Asian literature differ from all these? Yes, obviously, uh, like uh, Third World literature and uh, uh, is kind of area which, which is a financial or economic status divides the uh, like First World, Second World and the Third World. Otherwise, Commonwealth is a former colony, post-colonial, again, it's like uh, responses to the post-colonial, uh, to the colonial hegemony. But South Asia refers to a particular geographical, a very well-defined geographical uh, construction. Now, uh, Commonwealth literature uh, originated in Britain in 1964 as a description of the literature of the former British colonies, most of which had chosen to remain members of what was metaphorically called a Commonwealth of Nations. And the queen is still beside. But now this organization is uh, fading. And uh, uh, instead, we are, uh, I mean, even uh, today in uh, many universities, you can see that uh, Commonwealth literature is still taught, even in uh, University of Allahabad, for example. Now, the con another concept that is third world literature, uh, it was again very popular during the Cold War period. So, uh, uh, we know that uh, uh, when the Cold War was happening, America and uh, uh, Russian bloc, so America capitalist countries were the first world and the communist countries were the second world. And this third world, which were newly uh, liberated countries under the leadership of India, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, Egypt, and all. So, but you see this third world, uh, uh, the third world countries, which was like of uh, non-aligned movement in political image, was uh, kind of third, uh, th uh, in literature, it became third world literature. But we all know that this third world uh, literature uh, uh, became very infamous uh, when Frederick Jameson uh, wrote his uh, article, Third World Literature in the Era of Multinational Capitalism. And uh, uh, this essay uh, is kind of like where he tried to generalize the whole uh, uh, third world uh, imagination to a kind of allegory to a metaphor. So, uh, and though he has not used the global south, but yes, he is talking about the third world. So, you see, uh, and this, uh, I quote him here when he says that uh, third world text, even those which uh, uh, are seemingly private and invested with a properly libidinal dynamic necessarily project a political dimension in the form of national allegory. The story of the private individual destiny is always an allegory of the embattled situation of the public third world culture and uh, society. So what he tried to uh, do that, uh, uh, Jameson tried to understand this whole third world literature. And now the most uh, serious uh, critique was produced by Ejaz Ahmed, uh, who, uh, who was, I mean, and then this his critique was misunderstood also by, uh, you know, uh, later the, uh, the third world uh, critics, in the sense that uh, they all started uh, criticizing Jameson because he was a white and how can a white write about and how can he have this universalist approach. But uh, Ahmed's critique was more based on the theoretical framework, 
and where he, I mean, uh, Ahmad, he disputed Jameson's assertion of universalism. And he says that it is not possible to encompass all third world texts. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, he gives his own example, uh, Ahmed, that uh, uh, he is, uh, he can write in English, he's born in India, he can write in English, and he has edited uh, po uh, poems in Urdu. So uh, can Jameson understand about Urdu literature? Can Jameson understand about you know, other vernacular uh, uh, languages and literature? So uh, that kind of uh, essentialism which uh, uh, Jameson has produced controversial and is questionable. And we all know that Ahmed is a Marxist critic, Frederick Jameson again was a Marxist critic, but here uh, Ahmed has produced a critique of uh, 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 Frederick Jameson. So this notion of third world uh, became a controversial category. And now we all know uh, that he is uh, before, uh, with the, uh, 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 since the Soviet Russia, USSR is now no more into existence and uh, so the third world, the concept of third world is no more a valid concept in that sense also, because first there is no first world, there is no second world. But when it comes to the literature, uh, again, it was a Western production, whereby, uh, and it is very interesting to see here, uh, Ezra, Ezra Ahmed's essay about third world literature, when he writes uh, like how this whole notion of third world literature was produced in uh, US and European uh, academia, uh, where some of the Indian uh, professors and intellectuals migrated to uh, US and in order to have their own departments and in order to have their own identity, uh, some uh, texts uh, which may not have represented uh, you know, the indigenous, indigenous experiences, but were, were put into the category of third world literature and a shelf was, uh, you know, a particular space was allotted uh, in the library room uh, entitled third world uh, literature. Uh, just now we were uh, hearing uh, Professor Beshi's uh, uh, lecture and when she was discussing about uh, uh, the reluctant fundamentalist. Now, uh, a critic like Ezaz Ahmed or even us, we can question the whole notion of uh, this, uh, that uh, can uh, uh, the reluctant fundamentalist really represent uh, 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 Pakistan or the, the way he has written about the whole uh, idea about Pakistan and America, is it possible? Uh, so is it like more like construction which is doing because of the pressure of the market and economy and thereby he's uh, compromising with the whole uh, multiple uh, experiences of being a Muslim uh, from elite class and that too, I mean, from, you know, uh, he can speak polished English but at the same time, there are poor people, there are uh, uh, those who are not, in, uh, do, those who don't belong to the elite class. So what about them? So yes, that would have, that would have questioned this whole notion of uh, South Asian literature when reluctant fundamentalists get a place into the uh, syllabus. Now uh, coming to another uh, theory, which try to really look into the and this whole notion of uh, canon and Western uh, can uh, approach towards canon was a post-colonial theory, and it's not a new theory. And we all know we are all of us are academians, academicians, and you know, students. We all know. So I'm not going to talk about what is post-colonial theory, but yes, uh, we all know that it was mostly uh, like in American institutes that this theory was produced. We all know about Edward Said, and we also have read Ajaz Ahmed's critique of uh, Edward Said. But yes, post-colonial theory also challenged the notion of that West is uh, best. And uh, they try to you know, uh, uh, recover, they try to uh, regain the uh, lost sense of uh, glory. Uh, and they try to speak uh, for, the, uh, for the natives. So they wanted to become the voice of the uh, natives who could not speak. So for them, they wanted to become the uh, voice. But here uh, you see that all these three labels that we have just discussed about, I mean, the Commonwealth and Third World and Post-Colonial, uh, they all have uh, one thing in common, and that is that they are talking about the colonial history. They all accuse that a colonial past is responsible for our subjugation, and uh, they have marginalized us, and our experiences were never taken into account. Now, uh, here I will uh, bring V.S. Naipur to remind us that even this colonial past is um, 
it's a matter of time only and after some time this path will kind of like uh, it, it will be for, forgotten and it, uh, since uh, we have a great uh, civilizational past 3000 years old past and many uh, such uh, past have come and gone but we are still here so he compares it to like unfractured uh, civilizational history of over uh, 3000 years now <laughs> you see uh, so uh, yes we all know that what we are talking about here is the uh, south asian literature so uh, south asian literature we are talking about here the literature that is written in uh, english but is the is that literature only that is south asian literature because if you see whatever text today which i could uh, listen even five there must five when he was translated into english uh, you see uh, when you go through the poem you find that the whole uh, the whole song which is a gazal form is compromised uh, you see uh, this poem is represented as a uh, as a kind of like uh, 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 voice of resistance but when faiz ahmed was, faiz was writing it was basically the gazal that was in his mind yes of course uh, he has used that uh, gazal form to uh, to bring the voice of resistance but when it is translated into english it is a content that becomes more important rather, rather than the form so when it comes to south asian literature what literature we are talking about whether it is the english literature, literature that is written in english translated into english or are we talking about the you know, literature written in sanskrit tamil pali persian hindi urdu assamese and in so many languages as well and this is where uh, you see uh, so uh, like i will bring this another theory so that is uh, 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 nativism theory but before that uh, let me share one uh, you know experience which we have you know fa uh, faced in our academia and uh, that is that uh, you, know, uh, you know our universities uh, especially i will be uh, uh, i will uh, be talking about my own university that is university of salahabad uh, why i am taking uh, this reference here is uh, uh, that university of allahabad which was established in 1880s was was kind of uh, popularly known as oxford of the east and when this university was established the aim was to produce civil servants so that uh, you know they can assist the british raj and their officers uh, you know so from there the Club, which was the sole motto of Machiavelli, uh, sorry, uh, uh, my college education policy, uh, which he uh, discussed in 1835. Now, this uh, this University of Allahabad, if you see the question paper, the very first question paper uh, for English when they uh, uh, they they brought in, in 1894 or 95, I I'm not exactly I am uh, remembering that date. But if you see the structure of the questions uh, that were asked in those uh, papers, were like uh, you know, discuss Shakespeare as the uh, you know great uh, dramatist. So uh, you see, the, I mean, you don't have a space to counter him, to question him. Instead, you have to justify that question. And I tell you that even when we were doing our graduation in 1990s, late 1990s, such questions were still uh, uh, part of our academic curriculum. Now this university uh, was very powerful and very popular in 70s, 80s, and 90s, and uh, our syllabus was uh, basically full of European canonical writings. And uh, I still remember, and uh, we have heard. Sorry, uh, I got somehow disconnected. So this university. Uh, Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, sir. So, if you, uh, I mean, Harry Van Shri Bachchan, uh, there is one famous Hindi poet. I mean, he is no more. He is uh, father of uh, Mr. Amitabh Bachchan. Harry Van Shri Bachchan was a Hindi poet, a stage poet who used to go to the Mushairas, and he was the uh, he was a faculty member of uh, English department of uh, Allahabad University. And he has shared his experience that when he used to go to the staff room and he used to sit with the professors, 
uh, the professors never talked to him and they always mocked at him uh, and harvest uh, bachchan felt alienated because of his uh, kind of you know a special kind of english that he was speak, uh, speaking like bihar dominated that accent uh, he did not have that anglicized uh, accent so you know in the staff room no but he used to talk to him and he always felt alienated and uh, then he resigned from the department and he left uh, for bombay with his son amita bachchan and uh, off the record yes amita bachchan has not visited this university after that and if you see in his hindi movies amita bachchan has tried to popularize that uh, tone hindi tone that bhojpuri avadhi kind of tone chora sang uh, kinare wala that line is still popular because that he could see that uh, how you know the different departments and not only him uh, harivan sahib but even uh, think i mean uh, grandson of uh, premchand alok rai he was also a faculty member there harish trivedi harish trivedi was a faculty member there they all left this university and uh, went here or there to uh, join and what was the notion it was like what and uh, i mean this in was this department never considered the indigenous knowledge as uh, good knowledge if somebody is, yes exception is there that uh, fira gorakpuri uh, he also belonged to the same department english department and he was awarded gyanpeet but then uh, fira gorakpuri had great command over english also and uh, what he was writing was separately and he never brought it to the department that uh, Uh, urdu uh, writing but urdu had still got some kind of reputation but these you know local languages regional languages like bhojpuri or you know uh, uh, even in hindi only khadi boli is going to be accepted not the other uh, forms of hindi you are going to uh, i mean uh, value it so so for, now here what why it is so crucial and why i am discussing here is that this is where this uh, new theory which comes Uh, in the form of uh, nativism uh, becomes very important and very crucial for the uh, for the thinkers for the intellectuals for the you know uh, professors uh, because now this colonial hangover uh, whereby uh, you speak a particular kind of english and where you speak even hindi in that or sanskrit uh, i mean those colo- uh, those uh, canonical uh, things uh, which used to control us dominate us and define us uh, it was kind of suffocating for the uh, rest of the uh, people so this is where uh, gn devi and uh, uh, balchand nevade uh, comes to the rescue and uh, they uh, propagated the theory of uh, uh, nativism and uh, this theory of uh, nativism acha in the meantime i will uh, just uh, mention one more factor when i was discussing about south asia uh, you see that uh, when uh, we are talking about south asia how it is constructed so uh, recently you all have heard that nepal's prime minister mr oli he has claimed that ayodhya is in uh, nepal and uh, that ram was in nepal is now we can see a lot of whatsapp you know jokes on this but what it tells us about this uh, south asia you see nepal is a hindu country india again is trying to be a hindu country as hindu population here is dominant and nepal and india both are i mean in conflict a kind of cold war is going on but as far as cultural traits are concerned on a daily basis on a, an everyday basis uh, nepalese and indians i mean these up wala bihar or all they are not uh, any kind of uh, conflict they are not hostile to each other so south asia is not kind of that construction uh, what is you know like uh, north america or uh, europe where nationalist ideologies are uh, very dominant here uh, more of uh, you know a local uh, uh, conversation takes place where by uh, borders are like amita bhushesh the shadow lines where he says that imagine you know border is kind of what imagination uh, only so yes now i was talking about this uh, nativism theory yes before that nativism theory another theory was there subaltern theory and we all know that subaltern theory was kind of wing of post colonial theory and uh, the intellectuals in subaltern theory who were working either in australian universities or in uh, american universities uh, they also try to rewrite the history 
but yes one thing which they really contributed to this uh, you know uh, to the process of redemption of the native culture was that uh, they tried to talk about historiography that a new kind of history is required uh, to answer the uh, west and this history should not be written from the top it should be written from the bottom side and uh, gayatri chakravarti is your essay can the subaltern speak now though she has i mean uh, clarified her positionality about that uh, but uh, she has expressed the inability that how is it possible to write the history uh, you know how is it uh, i mean uh, possible to represent uh, someone else who uh, who self you have not experienced so that kind of uh, uh, i mean question is there challenge is there but yes now coming to nativism you see uh, what is nativism uh, so nativism is a celebration of the pluralism uh, that is at the very core of the indian culture and literature and uh, it is an interrogation of the existing canons uh, that are most often a continuation of the orientalist notions of indianness uh, governed by wrong premises like the privilege of high textuality and marginalization of the non canonical performative and counter hegemonic aspects now this nativism is the latest or the most recent theory whereby a new process of uh, writing and new process of critical outlook has been uh, discussed where uh, the question is not to answer the west the rather the question is to look into our own self and the very first thing that these nativist thinkers have done uh, they have first of all they have accepted that india is not a culture it's, i mean like south asia various cultures are there and all these cultures are region specific so region specific cultures are cultures which are i mean and that is one of the side effects also of the theory when we uh, try to make it region we are somehow making a boundary here but it is very interesting to see that uh, uh, regionalism for the first time has been celebrated it's not like uh, uh, not like i mean anti a uh, national it is not against the idea of nation it is rather contributing to the idea of a uh, nation but then this definition of nation is uh, is, is kind of uh, uh, different from the uh, definition what we get in uh, our constitution and in any constitution that is written now what what nativism actually has done first of all uh, nativism questions the very basic idea of creating a theory uh it is i mean quite popular in the among the intellectuals to theorize a bit to find easy categories to find definition uh, to make a category but the thing is uh, both uh, g n devi and nemad they, they are of the view that the concept of theory is a western notion especially in the wake of modernism uh, we started theorizing everything and we are searching for you know theories and one of the defects that our thinkers or our intellectuals have done that they have brought the western theory for the native culture which is wrong now for that purpose uh, you see uh, they say that we need to write our own history history of literature for example and yes uh, when i was i mean when i got uh, message from madam chitra that i have to deliver here a lecture then i try to look into the history of Uh, like indian indian literature or south asian literature and yes uh, one thing is there that when we talk about history of south asian literature it is mostly indian literature but uh, okay ob- uh, i mean i have no objection to it because india again is a plural concept for, which is founded on the basis of buddhism jainism uh, muslim culture and all sufism is there but when you are looking at this uh, uh, kind of a history of indian writing history of indian uh, literature sahit academy has produced the uh, uh, history of uh, 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 indian writing shishir kumar das under i mean shishir kumar das he has tried to uh, write uh, about around in 10 volumes he has edited and it's voluminous work and it is not possible to finish uh, in 10 20 days so i am not uh, an expert of that but one difficulty which has arisen here is is how to write how to encompass the various you know uh, histories because it has a long history and it has a very uh, region specific history so is it possible to write the history of indian literature uh, 
let alone about the south asian issue and this is where nativism is of uh, crucial uh, uh, i mean importance uh, that uh, we need to go for our own uh, our own uh, i mean history like uh, namor singh has tried to do in jnu ram bilash sharma has tried to do in lucknow university uh, ram bilash sharma is an english professor but he has written about about the hindi literature and he 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 has tried to respond to the uh, western uh, concept of indian uh, literature so this is where uh, nemade and devi both have uh, uh, contributed that region specific history now uh, for example if uh, bhutan for example as a as a construction uh, uh, karmau rajese has been, uh, i mean it is there in the syllabus and we all talk about it also if you see he has talked about i mean book needs construction but again if you see that essay is about what it's like monolith uh, construction of uh, one nation where lamis society or that for example dress culture or language even bhutan has multiple tradition so what happens when we are looking at the history of the nation we are undermining the uh, multiple identities Uh, one cannot be bhutanese first or one cannot be indian first first he has to be you know like in india he if he is from hindu background he will be of some caste then he will be of i mean gender caste then uh, region uh, sorry first religion and then reason only then you know a national identity can be formed or i mean even if it is doubtful if it, it, it can be formed and this is what ha- what is happening now in various departments of uh, uh, india uh, now like jnu has launched that uh, an indian response to the uh, western literature they have started uh, i mean working on it even in banaras hindu university now they are talking about that less indianize now when they are saying indianize they mean that uh, let's go for indigenous uh, knowledge the local knowledge uh, that are available but another thing is here what nativism has really done that it has also emancipated us from our own canonical uh, writings now canonical writings yes they are i mean since uh, uh, they are ordered they are disciplined and uh, it's not easy i mean uh, they have proved themselves with the passes of the time and they have uh, like uh, uh, ramayana uh, by balmiki or uh, mahabharata uh, they all are canonical writings that they have great messages and out to you are even with that but what happens that uh, under the burden of these major texts you know minor traditions so it's mn srinivas has famously called as uh, like little tradition uh, they are undermined and once they are undermined it becomes a brutal and violent aspect and uh, that is where the you see even today uh, like naxal problem in india which is happening here and there it is not as political as it is cultural because their culture is undermined and they are i mean uh, forced to uh, imitate a way of life which they have never you know experienced uh, or which they uh, don't so nativism has not only given us a kind of emancipation from the hegemony of uh, 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 english which jaj ahmed has famously called as monolingual dictatorship of india he has also emancipated the a uh, native uh, literature from the uh, indian canon like uh, sanskrit texts or persian persian was again i mean uh, kind of canonical uh, it was producing canonical literature uh, banaras was the center in uh, during dara shikos time when sanskrit literature was uh, he he wanted that they should be translated into uh, persian literature and when the british came they i mean they were against uh, these two languages but later on you know it is interesting to see that how sanskrit and uh, it became a kind of like canonical writing in again in 20th century uh, that status was uh, restored so this is what uh, i mean and nativism has uh, done to us that it has given us the liberty freedom and it has given uh, uh, us the scope uh, to think of our own roots that we need to go back to our own uh, roots and that's what we need. and this is where i mean nimade has famously called and uh, uh, our students must be also reading that essay that how uh, he takes the example of uh, dante and shakespeare who are you know great canons but uh, when they were writing like english for example english was not uh, even uh, so popular even in whole of england but uh, 
when he wrote and then colonization took place and they went everywhere and they brought i mean it is is a common knowledge of all but what he is telling here is what he is uh, informing us is that they were basically native writers they were uh, a kind of local writers and if they became canons it was because of the colonization so it means that canons you know uh, the nativists are uh, questioning and uh, rejecting this whole approach towards the canon and uh, they don't undermine it, it does not mean that they undermine the literary values of the of such text but apart from that and it, that is any text is a literary text it has a, it has its own values but apart from that it should not be the role model or it should not be like uh, uh, that it should guide and dictate that is how uh, uh, i mean culture or literature should be uh, developed or civilization should be developed as per the sanskrit or i mean whatever uh, canonical languages are there so <clears throat> now i will be concluding here uh, 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 by saying that if you see uh, how this uh, whole nativism is uh, doing uh, though it has its own yes it has its own side effects like uh, uh, it can be extremely self uh, uh, centered it can be aggressive it can create another kind of like uh, extreme patriotic uh, uh, ideological approach ah, but at the same time what it has uh, really inspired uh, and what it has done to you know uh, means the uh, faculty uh, means teachers like us yes, who have never been to the west or have never uh, shared that idea that uh, it has informed us about the roots it has emancipated us liberated us liberated us and translation is what is the best thing uh, to do here in such i think that we, to what extent we can translate our indigenous literature uh, instead of giving it, it as a responsibility uh, responsibility to you know children pollock or some other people uh, we should write our own uh, uh, we should translate instead of going for creative writing they focus more on uh, translation and that is what is i mean i also of i am also of the view that uh, if we can translate as much our native literatures into english or into other languages like dd kosambi one great uh, mathematician scientist and also historian uh, did it in uh, 1940 50s in the uttar pradesh region this is what is the uh, need of the uh, time so uh, thank you very much i uh, am i know that it was not kind of research paper or kind of a research uh, 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 writing it was just a survey but this is what i wanted to share thank you so much oh uh, thank you sir for that quite exhaustive exploration of south asian literature and for shedding light on the politics that goes into the making of the canon of south asian literature um if we have any questions uh, i request dr sayan to conduct the q and a session thank you so much uh, dr varma for this really uh insightful lecture and your reflections on the question of canonicity by positioning it uh, within the contexts uh, widely in india and specifically with examples that you shared uh, with respect to your experiences as well uh, so uh, i personally have a question but before that i would i just uh, was scanning through the chat box and i see urunduti patra she was actually also a presenter in one of one of the sessions of this particular conference she has a question and she just says that uh, sir i have a question and is that do you want to relate nativism to marginality through politics and she basically has like interlinked a set of questions is it true it's it's true that both terms are very much related to politics but do you think that marginality is only related to politics does it not relate to human psychology what's your opinion about it and then she also further adds that if so then how you relate both terms to each other may you please put your precious point on it yes yes uh, thank you uh, thank you shan and uh, thank you uh, arundhati as far as i can see and understand your question like nativism to marginalize uh, marginality through politics first of all uh, if you talk about i mean if you look at this theory nativism uh, it has it's it's not like uh, i mean 
addressing to the notion of marginalize marginalization as it is about redemption uh, redemption in the sense that uh, when we know our roots when we have great insight and we have understanding uh, about our own roots then uh, you know uh, then we will not look towards the rest first thing so marginal marginalization will never take place in that sense another thing which you are saying politics now i don't know in what sense you are talking about politics if you are taking that particular case of university which i was mentioning if you are talking about that how the professor felt you know marginal in the department and then he was left obviously uh, you know there was a time in 60s 70s and 80s and even today uh, it is existing because uh, uh, you know after this lockdown i can see that in some of the you know online education mode how many of the teachers are struggling for uh, like uh, speaking in english earlier since we didn't know what was happening in the classroom but now we can see directly when they are taking the classes online they are sitting there without small kids and how they are struggling and that's why new education policy has uh, come but yes marginalization is more uh, related to our own psychological experiences but it depends also on your context in which situation you are there what is the dominant uh, discourse for example if you are a if you are a hindi speaker in the department of sanskrit and if you have uh, now okay we have tulsi das ramcharit manas as a canonical text but earlier uh, when this canonicity was not established of tulsi das in banaras he was forced to you know remain in exile uh, because he was writing in uh, audhi uh, if you i mean uh, look at this whole notion of kashi then kashi is just uh, i mean from godavlia to asti and tulsi that was forced to live in uh, one sankat mohan mandir why so because he was writing in about ram and uh, his life and his achievements into a language which was not a i mean which was not canonical language which was not accepted uh, you know uh, I, i mean by the classical Uh, people so they forced him to leave that place and he remained there and supported by some you know low caste people uh, because uh, tulsi das could convince that he was writing in the common language so you need to see the uh, context politics is always there everywhere so it's not anything i mean here uh, new it is everywhere politics which is related to dominant uh, domination dominant ideology so uh, if i could i mean understand your question so uh, that's what thank you thank you so much uh, uh, dr verma for your reflections maybe arunduti might put her point here and just yeah she says uh, thank you sir i was just wondering to ask you with respect to the element of canonicity uh, that yeah. you were talking about and because mm-hmm. one of the aspects of your lecture is a question of canonicity and with respect to that you mentioned you gave the example of uh alabad university which was actually a quite a like a quite an apt example i must say because it was uh, we are very proud of the fact that it's called the oxford of the east but uh, if we look into the underlying politics the underlying uh, underlying factors that actually motivated to call it the Ox- oxford of the east is are actually quite problematic but uh but i think somewhere somewhat i think that uh the notion of canonicity what we usually i'm not generalizing i'm not saying everybody thinks in that manner but many people think in this manner that this notion of canonicity is by default refers to the western canons so people have this notion that if we dismantle the western canon and if we introduce our own versions in that case we are canonizing the space but i find this is very problematic why because when one canon replaces another canon now for instance we are replacing our own canon with our local language canons where we see sanskrit canons are coming where we see other language canons are coming and how they are figuring out by uh, kind of dismantling or kind of you know uh, throwing an insult to the other existing canons and generating hierarchies so basically the question of canon is it so as an individual as a as a as a thinker as a researcher what do you think that is it 
possible to just so should, don't you think we should expand our notion or our practice not notion exactly our practice of decanonization beyond just dismantling the western canons but also making sure that we also don't practice the same hierarchy within our own language canons as well. So, for example, where we people way often, to be very frank and honest, that Sanskrit canons are more are better than the Avdi canons, or maybe Tamil canons are, or maybe Bhojpuri canons are better than the Tamil canons. For instance, I mean, canons are there everywhere in every language. We can't, you know, uh, disagree with this fact. So, what do you think? I mean, shouldn't we? expand this practice of decanonization altogether instead of just focusing on the question that okay throwing away western text means we have uh, done decanonization indigenization of stories over because if we are practicing this pra process of canonization within our country through our own languages what we are doing is we are basically remanufacturing the very western parameters yes, that were once followed agree, agree. So what's, what's the difference yes, I agree. actually uh, yes uh, what uh, you are saying uh, shan uh, is, is, is correct. Uh, so I brought this idea of like a Sanskrit canon, for example. And even today, uh, when I was talking about this new education policy, I mean, I did not talk about new education policy. I just used that new education policy in India. So uh, uh, for the, I mean, yes, we are talking about like three language structures. So like one, uh, your own language, the other is English, and the other, another language from there. So this one idea which has come. But if you see even in today's scenario, okay, one thing what you have asked about this, uh, like uh, our own canon. First of all, Sanskrit canons, they have been challenged. They have been, I mean, uh, questioned. Now the need is to go to them and find it. You see, it's not that alternative traditions are not there. Uh, I still remember like in my villages, I mean, in these here villages or nearby uh, Banaras, if you see Sanskrit was, I mean, either, uh, I mean, it was only in this department of uh, uh, BHU, Banaras Hindu University, or at the most it was like there in the, some of the temples. But if you just leave that campus, you come out, there are very strong uh, traditions like folk songs, dances, which don't conform to the established uh, pattern. And many a times they are very vulgar. And um, I, I, whether uh, shine is aware or not, but uh, there was a kind of uh, like a uh, uh, holy festival uh, where at a sea heart, uh, there is this, you know, they, uh, like tomorrow is holy, so on this eve, they will go for a uh, performative uh, uh, event. And where they are, uh, I mean, criticizing or abusing and that why, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, really uh, themselves. So, yes, obviously, like uh, when you try to answer the canon and try, and then you try to create your own space, and to make it and to fill it and another canon you have created that will be happening forever. It's not that uh, if, uh, uh, I mean, if we are questioning English and rejecting English, some new language will not come. When English was evolving, French, French was the, I mean, dominant language. Sanskrit has been the classical language, but it has been challenged by Pali and Sanskrit and uh, you see Buddhism and all, they have written their literary work. So it's not the problem is with us. I why what I am sharing here the problem is with us. We are not reaching to them to our tradition. Uh, we feel that uh, the traditions are uh, I mean uh, I mean decaying and decaying. But just 50 60 kilometers away from Banaras Hindu University, there are strong I mean alternative folk traditions which are equally I mean modern. They have always raised the issue of gender. They have always raised the issue of you know past. And you see, uh, and even if you go to, you will find the communal harmony existing in, just like I, I'm telling you, you know, 50, 60 kilometers away from here. I have been to these places. The problem is that we have very easy categories of this canon. It is very easy for us to read them and to become scholars. This is what Ezaz Ahmed has, I mean, raised. And this is what, if you look at Didi Kushambi, I mean, he has uh, written about it, that the historiography that we are going to write, it should be uh, like regional and even in regional, you have to go and go and go into the deeper. So we will have to take attempts and we will have to take effort. Otherwise, I mean, yes, uh, simply, I mean, in the academia, they will be uh, this monopoly of uh, languages and literature will go on forever because it is easy for us, for faculty members. 
I hope, I mean, I, it's not an answer what Shan, because that cannot be answered, answered at all. What Shan has brought the issue. It cannot be answered. That's a fact. No, that's uh, perfectly fine. I'm uh, happy with your reflections. Uh, we can surely talk about it later. So, uh, but we have another question, but I think we are already running out of time and which I guess is partially answered as well. So I would like to request Dr. Rajeshree to take over and proceed with the session. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, man. Um, so uh, we have a guest from Italy who is going to deliver the final uh, plenary address in this conference. He is Dr. Alessandro Vescovi. He is already logged in. Uh, welcome to you, sir. Um, let me introduce, yeah, let me introduce Dr. Vescovi to the audience. Alessandro Vescovi is an associate professor in the Department of Modern Languages, University of Milano, where he teaches Anglophone literatures. He is part of the advisory boards of literature and Indology journals and series. He has published monographs, including one on Amita of Kosh, and articles on Indian writing in English uh, in several international journals. Uh, he is uh, also the editor with Ashish Day of the forthcoming volume, Amita Ghosh's Culture Chromosome, Anthropology, Epistemology, Ethics, and Space, to be published by Brill in 2020. A warm welcome to you, sir. And he is going to speak on R.K. Narayan's worldly appearance, a novelist between Hinduism and world literature. We look forward to your lecture, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rajli, for your generous introduction. And thank you everyone who has made this very interesting conference come true. I'm very grateful to the organizers, to the Yonfula Centenary College, to Mr. Shering Wangdi, and particularly to Dr. Chitra, who has been writing to me um, and has been organizing this thing wonderfully. I'm just sorry that time zones did not permit me to follow as much as I would have liked of this conference. Still, it is a great honor to be here, uh, or be virtually, but I hope I shall soon be able to thank my hosts in person. Now, today, um, I shall be speaking uh, about R.K. Narayan, but before that, I would like to make my position clear. So I will be talking a little bit about post-secularism and its bearing on literary criticism uh, before I zoom in on uh, Narayan. So the reflections that I'm going to offer today spring from two different critical approaches. Uh, the first is post-colonial criticism and the second is Indological studies. These disciplines have long coexisted in the academia, but unfortunately, they have seldom spoken to each other. I believe that their encounter can be a very productive one. And I'm sure that no one in the audience needs any explanation about the scope and methods of Indology, least of all for myself. But as for post-colonial studies, uh, I must say that I'm referring to one of the latest developments of this discipline, uh, which is, which usually goes by the name of post-secularism. As there is little consensus about the meaning and scope of the post-secular, I shall devote a few minutes to talking about this concept. So one of the first intellectuals who brought out the issue of the post-secular is Habermas, the German philosopher. And he points out that we are now living in a post-secular society. Habermas uh, actually is thinking about Germany and maybe more generally Europe, but this is true of the globalized world at large, I would say. And he wrote that the project of secularism has failed. Secularism, which was born in the 18th century together with rationalism, liberalism, was strictly associated with the idea of modernity. So to be secular is to be modern, or to be secular has been to be modern up to, up to now. 
for two centuries, the idea of secularism held sway in Europe and in many countries that feel the Western influence. The basic tenets of secularism were, of course, that the state should not be influenced by religions and that eventually the modern society would entirely do without religion. In the meantime, religion should be kept a private affair, so to say, while in public people would only show and speak from, uh, sorry, show their secular side and speak from a secular position. Every public debate should occur within secular precincts. However, Habermas argues, the increasing number of issues in which religion is invoked as a principle show that secularism has not fulfilled its mission. Indeed, the philosopher claims modernity and secularism are no longer synonymous. Historically, one of the political consequences of the post-secular condition is that the state must come to terms with religious communities and religious beliefs. The secular value of tolerance, after all, when it is taken earnestly, brings to post-secularism, as you have to tolerate even those who do not think along secular lines, uh, even those who do not share a rationalist view. In this sense, post-secularism accepts a constructive dialogue with different worldviews that do not share these rationalist or secular perspectives. Now, this political connotation of post-secularism brings me to some of its philosophical and thence literary implication of post-secularism. Uh, the first is that we can no longer presume that secular reason and morality exhaust the forms of valuable human flourishings. In other words, a particular openness to exploring non-liberal traditions is intrinsic to a politically responsible scholarly practice, a practice that departs not from a position of certainty, but from a position of risk, critical engagement, and a willingness to reevaluate one's own views in light of the others. In the West and in India, secularism takes on very different connotations. According to Manavrati and to Clayton Crockett, in the West, secularism is a kind of ideology, while in South Asia, it is a state policy devised to deflate communal tensions. Indian intellectuals who have supported this state policy have often also upheld the ideological, that I mean the Western understanding or the Western side of secularism. And this is all the truer with writers who expect to make their sales worldwide. In other words, secularism provides a space for discussion where people are expected to agree with or at least pay lip service to some basic liberal and rational tenets. Novelists or writers who want to be read outside their own community, I mean, whether they want to reach a world audience, but even when they want to reach a pan-Indian or a pan-South Asian audience, well, such novelists are expected to write from a secular position. Which does not mean that privately they cannot be religious. I'm just saying that when they come, when it comes to writing novels, when it comes to writing essays, uh, to a certain but lesser extent, when it comes to writing poetry, they kind of must switch to a secular mode. Rationalism is supposed to be the common denominator of different worldviews. 
a kind of coined language of the cultivated upper middle class, which can thereby discuss worldwide. Uh, recently, you know, <clears throat> I was discussing with a friend from my department who teaches Russian literature, and he was complaining that in Italian, we have a number of translations of Fyodor Dostoevsky, but much fewer of Lev Tolstoy. And he was wondering why uh, Italians do prefer Dostoevsky to Tolstoy. Uh, now, my opinion is that post-secularism or a secular take on literature may explain that. Uh, the Italian average reader who is a reader of Russian literature is certainly educated, um, middle class or upper middle class. And uh, well, he or she definitely prefers uh, Dostoevsky because of the secular attitude of Dostoevsky as opposed to the problematic religious attitude of Tolstoy. Now, I'm not saying that Tolstoy is not translated into Italian. I think every single line that Tolstoy wrote has been translated into Italian. So he, uh, his works are freely available in Italy, but still there are not so many editions as you have editions of Dostoevsky's work. Obviously, uh, writing from a secular position does not mean that you are never mentioning religion or that you are never mentioning religious character, priests, rituals, uh, believers, etc. Writing from a secular position means that you talk about them with a kind of detachment, as if every time you were mentioning a believer, you just put him into inverted commas. Religion, in order to be um, treated in modern novels, has to be rationalized. It has to be described as a kind of interesting anthropological feature. Thus, if you try and think of your experience as readers, you will find that in most cases, religious characters are either lower class, poorly educated characters, I mean, or sometimes the other end of the spectrum. They are ascetics. Well, in both cases, the reader is not supposed to identify himself with either, nor are the readers supposed to be, uh, sorry, nor are these characters, I mean, ascetics or, um, or peasants or uh, lower classes characters, uh, they are not supposed to be the alter egos of the author, the spokesman of the author. So secularism as an ideology for this reason has become hegemonic. And not only in the West, but also for those who want to write for the West. I'm not saying that writers are uh, writing for the West, but certainly West provides a very huge market, especially for Anglophone writers. And so uh, obviously when you want to write for a worldwide audience, you must think of the huge audience of the Anglophone uh, West. But this is not only what happens with those who write for the West. Think for instance of Chetan Bhagat, Chetan Bhagat is not writing, I mean, he is writing in English, but he's not writing for the West. He's hardly read, hardly translated outside the Anglophone, um, the Anglosphere, as Amitabh Ghosh says. So he does not write for a Western audience, but his attitude is definitely metropolitan and secular. So post-secularism, as I understand it, is not a return to religion, but a step farther. It is a recognition of the hegemonic role that secularism has had. Because very often this hegemony of secularism 
has been a silent one. The post in post-secularism is not to be understood as the post in post-colonial. In post-colonial, post means anti-colonial. Uh, it means uh, whenever you are, <clears throat> sorry, whenever you are talking about post-colonial novels, post-colonial literature, post-colonial criticism, you're always implying a critique of the colonial idea, and more recently, a critique <clears throat> of the neo-colonial idea, sorry. Now, post-secularism is not anti-secularism. Uh, post, in this case, is to be understood as post-structural, post-structuralism or post-modernism. So post-modernism is not anti-modernism, is not a return to uh, any ancient or older way, is just a step farther after the period that has been called modern. So post-secularism is, post is actually a space of dialogue that may accommodate both the secular and the religious. And please note that I am making a distinction between the secular and secularism. So the secular is a secular attitude. Secularism is the ideology which comes with the secular attitude. I am criticizing not the secular as such, I'm criticizing the ideology and the hegemonic role that secularism has come to uh, play. And now when it comes to literary criticism, a post-secular attitude may help to discover strategies of resistance to this hegemony of secularism and to see religious patterns woven into the narrative. These patterns may defy secularism at different levels. And I have identified the level of the plot, the level of human values, uh, simple everyday practices, poetical justice, ethics, epistemology. And I would contend that writers like R.K. Narayan, Raja Rao, Anita Desai, Amitav Ghosh, Kiran Desai, and even Jhumpa Lahiri, who is writing from a very um, American perspective, they all have somehow dodged secularism in some of their novels, if not in all of them. Um, and they have uh, dodged the censorship or the feeling of censorship that comes with secularism. And they did it by introducing non-secular elements disguised in their narratives as secular ones. Now, whether it is done consciously or unconsciously, with or without a political and a poetical agenda is a different matter. I think that uh, each writer, maybe each novel uh, has its own or his own or her own story about this. But this is something that I see happening all the time. These elements, these religious elements are there. And once you spot them, uh, you cannot pretend they aren't there anymore. Such elements, as I said, at the level of the plot may be me themes uh, taken from religious stories, you know, pieces of religious stories which are somehow translated into the language of uh, novelistic realism. At the level of practices, they may represent, for instance, good characters, positive characters, who are doing something that would be approved by religion or vice versa. Bad characters doing something which religion disapproves of. 
religious values such as abstinence, endurance, or sobriety may be upheld also in a secular context, making the reader forget that originally these are religious values. Or I also mentioned poetical justice. You know, the faith may punish blasphemous characters, even if this is not said in so many words. At the epistemological level, which is very interesting, uh, some incidents in the story uh, may not have a rational explanation. In Amitav Ghosh, it happens all the time. I don't know if you have read his latest novel, Gun Island. There are a number of incidents and coincidences that have, have no rational explanation. And this is a way of resisting this uh, tyranny of the rational which comes with secularism. And this idea that there may not, there may not be a rational explanation subtly counters the disenchantment that comes with secularism. Uh, now I will give you a very brief example of this taken from Amitav Ghosh's The Glass Palace and then move on to Narayan. Uh, I take Glass Palace because it's a very well-known novel. Uh, you probably remember the character of Arjun in The Glass Palace. Now, Arjun um, was somehow modeled on Amitav Ghosh's father. Uh, he is a soldier, uh, and he, um, at, at a certain point, must decide whether to, uh, during World War II, whether he wants to stay with the British and fight on with the British, or, and he was a soldier in the British Army, of course, or if he, if he wants to join the Indian National Army. Now, the very name of Arjun, of course, recalls the protagonist of the Bhagavad Gita, but that's nowhere, there's no point in the novel where this is uh, spelled out. Like Vyasa's Arjuna, Ghosh's character finds himself in this quandary. So whether he should join the Indian National Army supported by the Japanese. So in a way, uh, he has a political consciousness. He is, of course, aware of the fact that the Japanese um, were allied with the Nazi project. So uh, he really doesn't like this. But of course, he feels how the British um, we're treating India. So he wants to rebel against that and against the racism that comes with British dominion. Anyway, uh, so he has this option. He may join the Indian National Army uh, of Shubha Chandra Bose, or uh, he may remain loyal to the British Army because after all, before the war, he had pledged his loyalty to the British Army. The evolution of Arjun in this novel is a very uh, short Bildungsroman, a kind of Bildungsroman in a nutshell. The secular part of that story is that, uh, of course, Arjun has no charioteer, unlike Arjuna, to turn to and ask his questions. So he has no uh, divine guidance. He must go by his own feelings. And his soldier life has these two phases. The first is with the English, and the second one is with the, is with the Indian National Army. Now, when he is with the English, he's obviously morally lost. He is well fed, well fed. He eats roast beef with silver forks. When he understands his error, his political error, because his error is always spelled out as a political one, he tries to amend it by joining the lost cause of the Indian National Army. And then he can only eat what he finds in the forest and what he is offered by a few supportive locals. So his diet becomes that of a sannyasin. Ghosh's narrative, however, 
and this is the secularist side of the novel, never lingers on the religious significance of Arjun's diet. A post-secular reading of the novel brings to light the secularist ideology that has excised these elements without criticizing either the secular or the religious part of the story. So I will now move on to R.K. Narayan, highlighting a few religious elements surreptitiously woven into uh, his best known novel, The Guide. Now, again, of course, we know that the literary genre that goes by the name of novel was imported to India by the British. And culturally speaking, this is probably one of the most impacted consequences of colonialism, together with the adoption of market economy and more recently of neoliberal economy. The diffusion of the novel as a literary genre in India since the early days posed an aesthetic or more than one aesthetic dilemma that were connected to one another. What should the subject matter of Indian novels? In what language should they be written? What kind of characters should they depict? Should they talk about, you know, um, imaginary characters? Should they talk about Western characters like Western models? Should they talk about contemporary Indians and which class of contemporary Indians? And then at what readership should these novels be directed? So the choice of writing in English, which was enormously discussed by post-colonial criticism in the 70s and 80s, implies an answer also to some of the other questions. Writing in, in English means aiming at an international South Asian audience as well as to a worldwide audience. Such audience probably would favor realistic novels over romances and therefore they are writing novels rather than romances. They would be skeptical, I mean such an audience would be skeptical of magic or fantastic tales and therefore they turn to realism. They would look for insights into the lives of their own classes, like the um, European middle class has always done. And so they would uh, have depictions of middle class Indians, and they would often be on the lookout for some exotic reading experiences. And so they also have lookouts into uh, the lives of people who cannot read or write, so lives of people who uh, the Indian middle class would hardly uh, know. Thus, choosing the genre and the language implied almost automatically a certain poetics of the novel connected with its reception by both uh, a Western and an Anglophile Indian readership. Such readers were rather impatient, of course, with the uncanny, the supernatural, and everything that is not realistic in general, because they were expecting something similar, uh, something which could be considered as a response to the stimulus of the Western novels. On the other hand, they would be interested in sketches of Indian life for different reasons. Western readers would appreciate picturesque glimpses into Indian villages, Indian readers would be happy to see their own world finally described in literature. And this would put Indians and Indian fictions at par with European fiction. By the way, we should also point out a critique to realism recently brought up by Amitav Ghosh, namely that realism has often been understood not so much as the realm of the real, but as the realm of the probable. Thus, realism is somehow subjected to the laws of probability and of the stereotypical. Supernatural events, the uncanny, and religion would hardly find a place in this scenario. Actually, religion can be represented when it is part of an anthropological description, even more so when it is offered as a curiosity but not when it is endorsed by the 
implied author and requested as a requisite to follow or to appreciate the story. I believe this is a reason why Rajarao's Kantapura, which was, you know, describes the awakening of bhakti and political consciousness together in a small village in southern India, was successful also in the West because the protagonists uh, were mostly peasants. While Rao's later novels assume a reader that is familiar, not only familiar with, but even a follower of Advaita Vedanta. And so these novels could hardly cater to a wider audience. Indeed, a silent agreement about the poetics of novels, especially those who aspire to the status of world literature, is that the implied author must be essentially secular. So, of course, secularism, even in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, served a number of purposes and offended almost no one. Within India, it would downplay communal animosities and was therefore much welcome. In Nehruvian India, secularism was agreed upon as the only viable future for a peaceful society. Outside India, secularism would allow readers to look at Indian stories and Indian settings without challenging their own Welt and Chaum. In other words, to see the Indian novelist depicted um, their own land through the same values and poetics of the West was for the Western audience very reassuring at the political, philosophical and aesthetic level. So as I said at the onset, secularism in fiction has become almost a kind of censorship to be exercised in editorial boards, if not a preemptive kind of agreement between the writer and his or her international publisher. As it often happens with censorship, however, creative writers can dodge it rather than fully comply with it. My feeling is that R.K. Narayan paid lip service to secularism, as it were, but in fact wrote texts that may be read both as secular realistic novels and as instances of tales rooted in Indological matters. One may even argue that Narayan's much praised ironical attitude towards the people of Malgudi is not to be understood as irony in the Western sense at all, but rather as the wisdom of the Rishi, the uh, poet who knows fully well that all reality is after all a transient illusion and fictional realism even more so. Writing from such a position, one cannot see tragedy, nor really empathize with any of the characters. One can only wonder at the variety of people, the variety of feelings, the variety and colors of incidents which happen in this life or in the town of Malgudi. Now, focusing on the guide. Uh, Though I believe that similar observations could be made with any other novel by the Tamilian writer, I have chosen the guide because it is his best known uh, work. Now, at first sight, the guide is a kind of comedy, which includes a love story. The title may be viewed as ironic as it yokes together Raju's early professionist touristic guide and his later profession as a Swami. This tragicomic reading of the story did not cater only to a Western audience. In fact, it is the interpretation upheld by the film directed by Vijayanand and starring Devanand, uh, a hugely um, uh, popular film. So this film was a major success and it certainly helped this novel to become a bestseller. And it certainly gave this a comic interpretation of the novel. However, it is interesting that Narayan himself did not like the film adaptation. 
uh, he wrote a kind of memorandum about that in, um, in Life magazine under the title, The Misguided Guide. And um, it was later reprinted in his collection called A Writer's Nightmare. Now here Narayan uh, depicts himself like one of the many naive characters from Malgudi. He explains how the whole business of the filmmaking slipped out of his hand so that the story eventually was completely distorted. Particularly, Narayan complains about the choice of the location for Malgudi, which he imagined to be a village or something more than a small town in South India, while the movie was shot in Jaipur and Udaipur. Likewise, the shrine of the fictional river Sarayu, which Narayan himself had imagined after a village on the Kaveri River, was built with incredible, incredible costs on a stretch of sand by the Yamuna River a few kilometers from Delhi. Narayan's disliking of the film is surprising when we take some of his statements at face value. So in some of his interviews or um, or some of the introduction to his works, especially to the short stories, he says that Malgudi can be anywhere in India and almost anywhere in the world. Uh, another such statement is that what counts to him as a writer is just the story and nothing more. Not the characters, not the politics behind it, not nothing else. And therefore, Malgudi is a convenient setting, he says, because being non-existence, it provides a very flexible space. Actually, the plot in the film is not different from the plot in the novel. Surely something else had been lost that Narayan cherished and many readers did not notice, readers and viewers, I mean, did not notice. And I believe that something must be the, the, the religious non-secular dimension of the novel. There is a second reading of the guide, which was exposed by post-colonial scholars, and it relates to the clash between modernity and tradition. Malgudi changes the moment the train arrives, uh, bringing new jobs, new people, new customs, new mindsets. Among the new people come Marco, this westernized kind of Indian man who has no interest for the living reality of India and no in, um, interest for uh, the living art of his wives, but he only relishes antique caves. So he's definitely a kind of archaeologist, but ver a very Western-minded one. The character is named after Marco Polo, given his westernized attitude, and we don't know what his Indian name may be. All traditions of castes and loyalty to one husband's propriety, they are also appended in the new town of Malgudi, especially as Raju and Rosie go to leave together More Uxorio, scandalizing his orthodox mother who retreats to a village where there is no station and no train, but they are perfectly accepted by anyone else in the new town of Malgudi. So this second reading, this post-colonial reading of the novel uh, actually highlights some conflicts between the past and the present, between the new and the old, but uh, and certainly this kind of reading appeals to a more sophisticated readership, both, both in the West and in India. However, even when read according in, to, to this reading, to this post-colonial um, post reading, the novel retains a secular attitude uh, and some delicate irony. But the guide is also prone to be read according to a third and more Indological perspective, as Chitra Shankar, Shankaran maintains. The character of Raju goes through four different phases in his life story, which can be likened to the four ashrama of the Hindu tradition. Thus, he is first a brahmacharya who works as a tourist guide and learns his own way in the world. 
Later, he becomes a when he becomes Rose's manager. And then uh, interpretations differ a little bit. He goes through a phase as uh, Vana Prashna when he is in prison and lives as a sannyasin on the banks of the river. Or alternatively, he lives as a Vana Prashna by the river until his kismet draws him to confront the higher task of becoming a sannyasin, which happens at the end of the novel. This interpretation of the novel demands an understanding of and a subscribing to a Hindu viewpoint. Accepting that the man's life must be divided into Arkrama assigns a certain ethics to the character. He may have made mistakes, but in the end we see him on his way to perfection. While such perfection is questionable in the first comic interpretation of the novel, with an open ending, and it is of no consequence in the post-colonial interpretation of the novel. According to this third interpretation, the open ending is not an open ending at all. If we see Raju as a sannyasin by the end of the novel, his life cycle is complete. And I shall conclude by proposing another, even more radical view of the novel, which uses some of um, in some ideological mindsets. Basically, I shall refer to reincarnation. Unfortunately, I have no time to go into the many details of the story that might underpin my interpretation. However, Raju has in fact two distinct lives, one before landing in jail and one after he comes out of jail. The jail serves as a divide and also as a mild punishment for some of the sins committed in the previous life. Raju had been a bad manager, but in fact he had been a good guide, and the good karma thus accumulated helps him to confront his new situation as a spiritual guru. Whenever Raju is at a loss what to say or do, some bits of sentences of wisdom... <laughs> Sorry, is anything the matter? No, it's fine. Please go on. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, is anything the matter? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, I'm almost closing. This, so I said, uh, <clears throat> so whenever um, Raju is at a loss what to say or what to do, um, there are bits of memories, sentences, wisdom learned in his previous life as a brahmacharya that comes to his rescue. Uh, and being reborn as a sort of sannyasin, albeit a reluctant one at the beginning, um, is a sort of reward for whatever good he had done for the years of tapas spent in jail. Thus, it is as if Narayan was telling the life of a saint by recounting his two last lives, an attitude that is definitely non-secular and recalls the tradition, for instance, of Jataka tales. It is impossible to say if Narayan, under different circumstances, would have written a novel that spends several lives of one character. But we know that he did so in his collection of folk tales his Harikata, which is called God, Demons, and Others, uh, where Narayan lingers on the lives of Valmiki. In that book, he recounts three stories of Valmiki, uh, each devoted to a different incarnation of the, the poet. The first is a, fam is a family man, then he becomes a highwayman, and finally the Rishi, who saw and wrote down the Ramayana. In another novel, The Man-Eater of Malgudi, Narayan deliberately rewrites the meat of Basmasura with the technique of the realistic novel. And still, as the narrative sounds realistic and the literary genre appears that of any modern novel, the guide does not really betray any non-secular attitude. Still, I believe that Narayan's secularism is much more shallow than the readers care to admit. 
Indeed, it is more the product of compromise with the times and the publishing system than an echo of his own beliefs. Ironically, however, this tension between a non-secular worldview of the novelist and the apparent secularism of the novel have merged seamlessly to produce a wonderfully nuanced literary work. And I would like to conclude with a notation. The difference between the popular comic reading, the post-colonial reading, and the post-secular in the logic reading of the novel is not so much in the location of the possible sources for the story, whether they are invented, whether they are an instance of realism or a rewriting of old myths. The important difference is in the writer's attitude and in the position that the reader chooses to occupy. My conviction is that the greatness of Narayan as a novelist lies in his ability of writing convincingly at all three levels. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Viscovi. Um, uh, maybe we can have a short Q&A session. We have about 10 minutes and I request Dr. Sayan to conduct this session. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Vescovi, for this really uh, fascinating lecture. In fact, uh, last last semester, when uh, Dr. Ashish Day came as uh, one of our resource persons and as an external for a research visit, we had a brief communication with respect to this specific project uh, that uh, that was al already mentioned by Dr. Rajesh Rival introducing you and also about Amitav Ghosh that you're doing. And it's also briefly you mentioned about while you were delivering your lecture. So it's so nice to uh, listen to it. And we must say that we are, we are very much looking forward to, you know, looking forward to get it, see it getting published because uh, Gun Island is the latest book of Amitav Ghosh. And many of us, unfortunately, still could not read it. So obviously we are going to grab it soon and then we are going to look into your project. So I'm, going to, I'm sure it's going to very much help us in the process of understanding it as widely as possible. Uh, now we already have a, have a question uh, in, the, in the chat box and it is from one of the participants, Wiggins Bakka. Uh, basically he has this set of questions which are interlinked to each other. And he says that professor, as you noted, secularism is a, liberal view, but exerted a silent hegemony, does it mean that there is nothing liberal about liberalism? <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, post-secularism promotes a dialogue between faith and reason. Is this not a liberal view? If this is liberal view, then, then there, is there anything liberal about post-secularism? and how this concept can be easily misinterpreted in age of resurgence of religious fundamentalism in West Asia and other parts of the world. Well, yes, this is a very interesting, obviously this is one of the most debated uh, issues uh, among those who work with post-secularism. Um, I, I may refer to uh, Ashish Nandi's book, for instance, which is very interesting from this viewpoint. Uh, obviously, uh, I think that it is vital to distinguish between the idea of the secular and secularism, uh, as we distinguish between liberal and liberalism. I mean, liberal is just an adjective, but if we use the liberal, this is a very um, this is a very important political and cultural stance that we may um, that we may think of. Uh, so the liberal implies that uh, we must accept different views. Liberalism actually subtly implies that we only accept liberal views. Now, when, whenever we talk about liberal, by the way, um, we also must distinguish between liberal as a kind of philosophical idea and liberal as a economic uh, practice, because they're different things. Uh, so I am only talking about liberal as a kind of philosophical political idea and not as 
um, an economic practice because when it comes to the market, the things change completely. Liberal economy is not liberal at all. Um, and the same thing is with secular and secularism. I was trying to make this point. Um, secular is tolerant. Secular means that we accept uh, every different viewpoint and that we understand the limits of our own viewpoint. So it's very difficult today uh, in a globalized world to see that um, my religion is uh, the only true possible religion. My ideology is the only possible ideology. Now, uh, when you're doing this, you become a fundamentalist. And of course, there are many places where fundamentalism has been resurgent. And this is one of the reasons why uh, liberal states, liberal thinkers, liberal um, intellectuals have to come to terms with otherness, with the otherness of religion. Now I think that one, well, this is a very personal opinion. Um, and this is just uh, how's that? an hypothesis I'm working on. Um, so just take it uh, with some, with a pitch uh, of salt. But anyway, uh, I think that there were, uh, very, the, there was little um, about fundamental, there was little fundamental, or there is little fundamentalism wherever you have intellectuals and an upper middle class of intellectuals dealing and using religion. Now, what is happening in many parts of the world, and I'm thinking, well, in South Asia sometimes, um, sometimes in the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, even in, in Europe and certainly in America. Uh, when religion becomes a matter of identity more than a matter of spirituality, and when uh, intellectuals just drop religion altogether and take refuge into secularism and forget about religion, what happens is that religion is left to fundamentalists. This is what invariably seemed to happen. Uh, and so what I think is that uh, one of the major mistakes of uh, word intellectuals is that they kind of um, paid uh, either lip service or just they became uh, secularists and their own traditional religions have been left to uh, fundamentalists because they are no longer nourished by, uh, let's say, more sophisticated philosophical uh, ideas of tolerance. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for your, for your reflections. Uh, and uh, we have one Another question from Mr. Himanshu Kumar. Uh, and the question is, can we say that Narayan presents more of artistic reality and less of photographic reality, especially when dealing with mysticism and religion where the boundaries get blurred too? Well, my opinion is yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, if he wanted to present a more photographic reality, uh, as you put it, uh, I think that he would have uh, written um, about Miser, he would have written about Madras. Now, he wants to write about Malgudi because he's not interested in photography, but is more interested in uh, real, in, 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 in uh, so in painting rather than philosophy, than photography, if you want to follow this. So uh, Narayan is, is a painter. He is not a photographer, definitely. And when you're painting, obviously you are interpreting things through uh, a poetics. And a poetics is also based on some kind of worldview, of world vision, on some kind of philosophy. And this is definitely what we have when we uh, read Narayan's work. So definitely, uh, although, I mean, post-colonial um, criticism is very interested in photography and less interested possibly in, um, in, in painting. And so uh, the photographic or realistic 
side of Narayan has been more explored than the other one, but certainly I think that uh, Narayan is more of a painter than a photographer. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Vescovi, for that uh, extremely thought provoking lecture. Uh, actually, I had this is not exactly a question. Um, I would just like to add to your reply to the previous question, if I may. Uh, when where you were, uh, the question was, how do we avoid the dangers of uh, this whole idea of post secularism being misinterpreted, especially during this era of a resurgence of fundamentalism in various parts of the world? Uh, I think this misinterpretation can be avoided to some extent by drawing the distinction between these two uh, different meanings of the term secular, which you did point out right in the beginning of your lecture. Uh, the first meaning is in uh, it is the term secular is used in a more general sense, but in where it refers to something which is independent of religion. Uh, and in the second sense, which is a little more particular, uh, for example, in the way the term secularism is enshrined in the Indian constitution, which implies uh, a tolerance between different religious communities. So I think the term post secularism, it uses the word secular in the first sense, in the more general sense of the term. It does not um, mean that we have returned or we need to enter an era where we do not need any more tolerance between religious groups. I do not think that is what it implies. And also um, the question about how do we, uh, you know, this whole question about resurgence of fundamentalism, I just want to, um, Add one small point that maybe the term fundamentalism itself, that uh, the out and out negative connotation that it has acquired in the current usage of the term in the world, it need not necessarily be so. That was not originally, it was not what it has, well, become now or what it is believed to imply today. Yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Oh, yes, I, uh, I mean, you, you, I subscribe to every single word you said. Um, Definitely. Uh, well, the problem uh, now, when we say fundamentalism, we actually uh, use this word as uh, an umbrella term to say religious violence or violence based on uh, religious justification. And this is something that uh, is, I believe, unacceptable in, in, in any way. But still, um, what what doesn't make any sense is that you cannot uh, use your own religious convictions whenever you are going to the poll or whenever you are just deciding on any national or political issue. I mean, the, the, your Weltanschauung, your worldview, uh, the way you think uh, religiously or not religiously must have a bearing on your uh, social life. Uh, and this dichotomy between private religion and, uh, and social life is unhealthy, basically. Because the only ones who were uh, allowed not to leave this dichotomy were those who upheld a secular view. So basically atheists or uh, very secular people, uh, they were the only ones who could just uh, think in private and publicly in the same way. And I think this shouldn't happen anymore. I think that we should be ready to accept that different people have different habits, different beliefs, and that we can learn from them. Exactly like it happens in India, you know, I, I've been to India several times and very often I've seen that um, vegetarian people, for instance, those who are vegetarian for religious reasons, uh, may offer meat to their guests uh, when they are met, they don't, they don't partake of it, of course, but they offer meat to their guests. They just say, well, you know, my religion forbids me to eat meat, but I understand that your religion is different. So this kind of tolerance that I have seen several times with uh, rituals or with forms, with actual, uh, yeah, with, with the forms of hospitality, I should, I think should be extended to ideas and uh, the ways of thinking. And I hope literature may help in, in this process. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for your reflections. I think we will quickly take the last question before we finish up the session. 
And the last question is from Professor Jagdish Batra, and uh, she and he asks, uh, Professor Vescovi, do you think that at some stage we will be rid of this terror of secularism? It's a wonderful question. I think it's a it's more a question for the audience than for myself. I mean, it's a question for each of us. Uh, are, are we actually terrorized by secularism? Um, I'm not terrorized by secularism myself, but I think that we should move on. And I think it is the duty of the intellectuals, uh, those who deal with ideas, with philosophy, and with books, mostly, uh, to try and move on. And as I said before, I think it's a pity that for a long time intellectuals forsook religion uh, so that religion has, in some cases, uh, become the province of violence and of uh, fundamentalism. Uh, so religion itself has become a very totalizing, in some cases, has, been, has become a very totalizing experience. And I think this is wrong. I think we should find a way to uh, live alongside uh, one another and live alongside one another's religions and worldviews. So I think that we really should work for, for this, but I don't think that we are really, um, we should, I mean, it's only we intellectuals that can do something for that. Uh, and we cannot expect that secularism will take care of itself or post-secularism will take care of anything. I think we have to think, discuss, and, uh, and read. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, altogether. And it was really an enthralling session for all of us. And now I request Dr. Rajeshree to take over and proceed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Viscovi, for uh, taking our time and for joining <coughs> us. That was a very engaging lecture. With this, uh, we come to the end of this final uh, plenary session of our conference. Um, and we had this conference offered us the opportunity to listen to some extremely uh, illuminating and engaging lectures. And it also gave us the opportunity to, to glimpse into the research work being carried out by young scholars all over South Asia through their presentations. Uh, but so meanwhile, uh, yeah. uh, Rashri, let me inter intrude to thank Professor uh, Vescovi, then we can move on just briefly. Yeah. So thank you, Professor. We are immensely grateful to you for joining us. And I would like to thank Dr. Assis uh, for introducing uh, such a wonderful person who has made our third day conference very enriching. And we also had a handful of students from Mahishadal, presenters from Mahishadal Raj College, uh, who have acknowledged uh, this presentation as a very meaningful lecture. And this is third or fourth time. They had been fortunate to listen to you for uh, many number of times. Thank you for sparing your time and being with us. We look forward to stay connected in future too. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really an honor for me to be here, as I said, a great honor and very grateful to you all. Thank you. Yes. And now I request Rashri to take over. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, I would just like to take this opportunity to request and uh, to invite the participants of this conference to offer us their valuable feedback and to share with us what their experience in this conference has been like and uh, to offer any suggestions they might have so that we may improve our work even more in the future. So if there are any reflections from participants, uh, kindly share your reflection about this conference in briefly in few words. We will entertain uh, two or three participants to express their views. And um, briefly, I would like to 
announce uh, to Professor Jagdish Batra in particular, sir, uh, the session is in another Zoom link. Uh, okay. And we are waiting for you as a chair there. All right. Thank you. I'll be there. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So participants, do you have anything to share? Or else we can wind up here. So please be quick to join us. Or if you have any uh, thoughts and you need some time to frame them into um, a proper suggestion, you can do that in the well degree well session. We have uh, the well degree session starting at 3 p.m. IST. I think we don't have any feedback. Okay. Yeah. So once again, thank you, Professor, and we will uh, end the session here.